and the net. <laughs> and the net. And usually, you know how these shows run. We usually run about 10 or 15 minutes and blab and blab. We? No, we don't yeah, blab. We don't <laughs> you blab. Blab and blab. It's not going to happen tonight. Tonight <laughs> we have a very special guest. And I'm not going to waste any of his time having him listen to me blab about it. So here we go. In 10 seconds, <clears throat> buy me a copy, join, become a member. Videos coming out this week. We've got a show Sunday, and that's it. And a snowstorm tomorrow. And a snowstorm tomorrow. How many inches? They're 10, saying four 12, to, 4 to 8. 4 to 8. I, I know Frank would four appreciate that. Snow. No. So I hope everybody can hear us. Hope everybody can see us. Cool, cool. I want everybody at this point to close your eyes. Just listen for a minute. If I do that, I'm, I'm going to go to sleep. I know, me too. I hope I don't. See ya. So I'm going to use my, my relaxing voice here, and I'm going to say, imagine you're looking at your animals. In your, in your mind, imagine you're Am looking at your... Yes. Oh. Imagine you're looking at your animals, your reptiles, and you're going from enclosure. Maybe you have two enclosures. Maybe you only have one. Maybe you have 468 enclosures. But imagine you're going from enclosure to enclosure to enclosure, and you're taking a look at your animals, and you're watching their behavior, and you're trying to gain as much knowledge as you possibly can. You're trying to, to make sure that you can care for your animals the best that you possibly can. Oh my gosh, you stop in one or in front of one enclosure and there seems to be an issue. The animals are all in one corner. The one of the animals is up on top instead of being where it should be. One of the animals is right up in front. It seems like one of the animals isn't eating. What do you do? I have advised over and over and over again on this channel. Find three people that really know what they're talking about. I, I could be included in that, and you can send me questions, but find three people that you can go to and say, hey, what do you think? What's going on here? Help me, and find three people that will help you. There's a better way, folks. All these years I've been saying go to three people. There's a better way. There's a better way. I keep animals in boxes. So does Joe Hupp. So does John. So does Jean. So does Julie. We keep animals in boxes. So what's the better way? What's the better way? The best way to know how these animals behave and interact and handle situations is observing them in the wild. Well, how do we do that? Well, I know I can't go to Belize or Yemen or I probably will never find my way to Australia. However, that opportunity is available for many, many people. And even in your backyard, go out and observe and understand the behaviors of these animals. There's nobody that I know of that can help us understand what we can do to achieve that than our guest tonight. Our guest tonight... Oh my gosh, I, I don't even know where to start with the accolades. Can I open my eyes yet? You can, everybody open your eyes. Everybody open your eyes. Sorry about that. Frank. Colich <laughs> Frank. <laughs> Frank Colachico. I hope I'm pronouncing that wrong because I, I know I'm not. Uh, has been a long time, long time reptile keeper. I would consider Frank to be an expert in the field. Um, he's an adventurer. <clears throat> he's gone to many, many, many different places. He's a speaker. He's a national speaker uh, at the Gecko Symposium that we've seen a couple, three times. And he's a great storyteller. Um, the very first time I, I had the great opportunity to listen to Frank talk about reptiles in the wild, the, the first two sentences out of his mouth, I was absorbed in his storytelling for the whole time. Um, I want to mention also that Frank does, not enough, but he does uh, create videos uh, on the uh, YouTube channel called Reptile Diaries. He, he needs to do more. I, I, if I had one critique of Frank, it's that he needs to do more videos on this Reptile Diary, Diaries uh, channel that he has. You see his face in the green room looking at you? I do, Frank. <laughs> Let's bring him on. 
Frank, how are you doing? Oh, uh, I'm doing well, man. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. It's a hundred percent our honor and privilege to have you on. Uh, like I said, I, I don't know many people that have more experience than you. I don't know if I know anybody with reptiles from a broad standpoint than you do. I, again, the only probably fall down, you probably started to turn this off and get out of this whole thing. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? Colachico. Yeah, you did. You did. You nailed it. Colachico. Yeah, that is it. Um, what? I yeah, you gave me quite, quite some large shoes to fill there. That's Big shoes to it, fill by what you just said all about me. I have a lot to live up to here. No, Hopefully. no. Well, <laughs> again, I've heard you uh, speak two times. I've watched like every one of your videos on Reptile Diaries over and over. And I, <clears throat> I wish I could take just one minute and ask everybody to go over to uh, YouTube, go over to Reptile Diaries and subscribe right now. But don't leave the no. channel just yet. Don't leave the channel just yet. In the description. Repti Reptilian Diaries is what it is. Reptilian Diaries. Reptilian, Reptilian Diaries. Diaries. In the description of this live stream is a link so go over there after the show and make sure that you subscribe to reptilian diaries how is everything going with you things are good man um i live in california so it's uh we're we're getting into spring um i'm on the coast and so it never gets really hot here but the weather is turning my animals are awake the animals around my property are awake so yeah it's spring so actually i think today's the first or the second day of spring um so yeah man it's i can't complain what does spring look like to you now we're spring here and we're expecting 10 to 12 inches of snow outside tomorrow so yeah. that's spring to us in wisconsin spring here man is uh, i mean i'm i'm very fortunate to live probably in one of the most beautiful places in the united states i live in santa cruz california which oh. is right on the beach just south of san francisco so i mean even winter winter spring and fall all kind of look the same um i'm on a pretty big property and we have rolling green hills and i'm looking right out here there's a big willow tree and so spring to me is when the willow starts getting its leaves back and this willow lost its leaves for maybe a month and it's already starting to get the, the leaves back. Um, and then I keep a lot of reptiles outside. And so when I start seeing everything basking again, then hey, it's spring. That's funny because it's just like Wisconsin too. Oh, I'm sorry. We have uh, leaves <laughs> on trees for only one month <laughs> here in Wisconsin. The other way around. Never been to Wisconsin, but I've heard, uh, I have a friend who actually, I actually have a couple of friends who, who live in Wisconsin. So Maybe one day I'll get out there, but I've I've heard that it's quite cold there. It's cold. It, it's yeah, it's it's cold. So during brumation, you know, everything kind of cools down naturally in our our facility in our basement. But right about this time of the year, I go downstairs with my ice chipper and I start getting the geckos ready. And you know, I'm thinking in two or three months they should be you know warm enough to start breeding. <laughs> yeah, hey, that's how you really cool things down. That's right. They are cool. They are cool. Tell me, I know a, I know about Frank, the adventurer, the reptile keeper, the reptile expert. Tell me about Frank without using one reptile reference whatsoever. Who is Frank? Um, I am, I don't know. I'm a dude, man. I, I, uh, I surf, I skateboard. I'm an outdoors guy. I've got two daughters, got a wife, um, California, California guy, lived in California my whole life. Um, and I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm very interested in things, like in things. I have a lot of hobbies. Um, a lot of them are, are kind of loosely revolved around reptiles, but I do have just a lot of different, different hobbies that I'm, I'm into. And I get, I can really like just, get pretty obsessed about a certain thing for like a while and like like i have a boat and i just get really into the boat and you know do, going through the motor and you know getting all my fishing stuff set up and making sure the boat's all you know legit and then the winter comes and then i forget about the boat and then i get into something else and then <laughs> spring's starting to spring's turning or you know like i said spring's starting so i got to go out in the barn fire the engine up check the boat out pull it out and um get ready for that again so i'm i'm like I overburden myself with hobbies, definitely. I, I You're talking remember. about a boat, but you, so we have to be very, very specific here. And I told you before the show, we could talk for 
like 13 days in a row just on yeah. reptiles. We could talk the, the rest of the show about fishing. What yeah. kind of fishing do you do? Uh, I do deep sea fishing because I'm on uh, the coast. I'm four minutes from the beach. And so I'm I'm between two two different uh, boat launches. I got the Santa Cruz County Harbor and then I've got a Moss Landing Harbor, which is just south of me. So I'm 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 30 miles north of Monterey. And so we don't have the best fishing up here, but we get, I mean, we've got halibut year round. We've got lingcod rockfish, and then we've got albacore a little bit north. And then the last couple of years, we've had bluefin within 17 miles of the ramp. So um, I've got a 16 foot arima, which is, which is a, it's the biggest, it's the smallest, largest boat you'll ever, you'll ever be in. So it's a small boat, but it's very designed and built for heavy water. And so I can go out in, in pretty big seas with it and just feel real comfortable. You get a little bit wet, but it's not going to sink. It's kind of like a Boston whaler. They're foam filled hulls. So they're not sinking. They're not flipping. You're safe. As long as if you got the stones to get out there, you, the boat will, the boat will hold you. How, how big with that boat, with your equipment, what's the biggest thing that you could handle? You're talking about tuna before. In terms of fish, yeah, we can. I haven't got one yet, but I'm planning. Once I, I'm going to get a new motor at the end of this year, and we go out for the tuna. The tuna out here that run between San, Santa Cruz and San Francisco are like 120 pound class. They're big tuna. Wow. They're not East Coast bluefin, but they're. I mean, anything over 100 pounds is a big fish. Now. Do you go out with other people? Do you go on charters? Do you you just uh, load I go up out the with boat one or two off? guys? My boat max is three people with fishing gear, being able to move around and stuff. So max of two friends. Charters out of here, I don't do just because it's all. I mean, I have my own boat, and it's all rockfish and lingcod and stuff. When I lived in L.A., Los Angeles, I would do charters out to the islands and and catch yellowfin tuna and yellowtail and sea bass and that kind of stuff. But up here, we don't have quite the fishery, but we do have good stuff. And it's also rad to have a boat just to take the kids out, take the family out. We can shoot across the Monterey Bay, down to Monterey, have lunch, shoot back. Like, it, there's fun stuff to do. What a blast. What a blast, especially for the kids, too. You know, here in yeah. Wisconsin, unfortunately, you know, we get some big fish like, you know, eight and nine inch bluegills and 14 inch crappies, 14 inch crappie. That's a big fish. Yeah, that's a big catfish. You guys get like pike and walleye and stuff, don't you? We do. We're known for, you know, well, Wisconsin is known for the walleye. Well, where does Phil live? Phil Tremper lives in, doesn't he, isn't he in Wisconsin? I think he's, he's there. He's up does. in Green Bay. Green Bay is a great fishing spot for muskies, northern yeah, he, pike, smallmouth, all the game fish. Yeah. Fishing. yeah. So I've got to call Phil up and say, hey, take me fishing in your boat and let's go. Yeah, he's, he, he, yeah. Him and his wife do a lot of fishing. Ice yeah. fishing. A lot of ice yeah. fishing, too. He sends me photos. How old are your kids, Frank? Uh, my one daughter, Maya, just turned eight yesterday. Oh, um, and then my other little hurricane is going to be two in May. <laughs> and her name is Nova. And she is, oh, my gosh. She, she, okay, you were talking about I should make more Reptilian Diaries videos. You can blame her for, uh, there's no time. I, I have no time <laughs> to do anything. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, yeah, I the channel's not dead. It's just that I don't have time right now, man. I got a I got a one and a half year old, or I, I got a twenty month old baby who's just like, and I'm 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 stay at home dad. I'm not well. I'm I'm actually I wear multiple hats because I'm working from home and I have my reptiles, which do some income, and I have to watch the baby. So yeah, my my days are super busy, but it's all she's getting old enough to where now she start. We've got her in preschool two days a week. Um, and so things are changing and I'm actually leaving next week on a reptile trip out of the country. So there'll be a new, ser new series coming pretty soon, which will be rad. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Mm -hmm. Are you got your list of questions or your spreadsheet? Yeah, I've got my spreadsheet of questions. So I have yeah. to stick to the script. I will jump ahead. <laughs> so we know a little bit about <clears throat> Frank, the person. Tell us about Frank, the reptile keeper excluding the travel excluding stuff like that because i want to dig deep into that in just a minute reptile but, frank um reptile frank just a kid like probably everybody else um like i, I grew up in like i said i grew up in in kind of central northern california uh in the redwoods and i just like when you live here outside is a big part of your life whether you're at the beach or whether you're in the woods 
And being a kid, I was lucky enough. My dad uh, owned a, a pet shop in Santa Cruz. And so, I mean, to me, life with like, it, to me, I grew up, I mean, it was so normal for me to have a big boa constrictor in the house and to have tropical fish tanks all over and to have a blue and gold macaw and a sulfur crested cockatoo and all this stuff. Like, and I have a chameleon that my dad would just put out in the tree in the day and then go and get him in the night. Like it was just, that to me was so normal. And so, I mean, it was, it's hard to, like, I don't even remember kind of when it started. I know that the first geckos I bred was when I was like 11 or 10 was Toke geckos. But other than that, it's always been reptiles. Always. Okay. I go out in my backyard. Every single log is getting flipped every single day. And whatever I'm finding is, is going to get put in a 10 gallon aquarium for a while. And then my dad will make me let it go. Eventually a lot of alligator lizards, um, you know, a lot of fence lizards, a lot of salamanders, just all kinds of, uh, I mean, we don't have a huge array of reptiles up here, but we have some good ones. And so, a lot of uh, a lot of good stuff growing up like that, and I just never never shook that. I never was able to just stop doing that. Like a lot, I mean, I got really into skateboarding, um, really into surfing. Where like that was my life, and you know, growing up when you're you know 18 to 20, whatever, I'm skateboarding, I'm chasing girls, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. But I still always had reptiles. Um, there was a there was one mo there was one point in time I think when I was like 22 or 23 where I had one like Aryan Jaya carpet python. Sorry, that's the terror screaming if you could hear. Sounds um, like mom's right. Yeah, that's yeah, fine. He's, he is that's life. Good, meaning that scream I don't have to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so th there was one time where I just, I was down to one snake and that lasted for a couple months. And then I was like, nah, this isn't working. And then I just brought the menagerie back. So I've always, I've always kept reptiles, lots of them. Um, and it's always it's always been geckos, geckos and lizards. I mean, I'm into snakes. I definitely try to be very well rounded with my at least with what I learn and what I teach myself in terms of like I want to be able to hold a conversation with anybody. So I know about snakes, I know about turtles, I know about amphibians, geckos, lizards, monitors, whatever. Um, and I did like I said, I never got out of it, and so it just kept growing. I mean, it just the knowledge kept coming. I kept different things, and soon without going into the travel thing, it was just like, Hey, I've, I've flipped these boards so many damn times. Like, let's go flip some other boards somewhere else. And so, you know, started going further and further away from home and it progressed from there. I think that was the very first video that I saw on reptilian diaries. You were flipping boards. I don't know if it was your first video or way back when, but it was with me and Hussam, I think. Yeah. So I I have to admit I know nothing about snakes. I know nothing about other reptiles. I'm, I'm just so narrow focused on geckos. It's it's sad, and I can't carry on a conversation with other. Hey, I'm going to keep this boa, and it has this hat, and, and I'm like, huh? I, I don't get it. But watching that video of you flipping over boards was just enthralling. It, it was just so cool, so very cool to see you doing it and finding stuff and your excitement and. It's funny, sometimes I can, and I think other people can too, five minutes, not even, and you understand the passion that somebody has for their interests and how how engaged they are and how excited they become in probably finding the same thing that they've found before, but just in a different spot or a different way or a different behavior or whatever. But I could tell in just the first few minutes, how how passionate you were with the hobby, and I was hooked on your your channel like like that. Subscribe, done. Thank, thank you, man. <laughs> so you've been keeping reptiles your whole life. I, and this show is about you. It's not about me, but I have to share a real quick story. I had a business trip out to LA, and at that time I was keeping fish, and I wanted to to visit a. a uh, good friend that was keeping fish out in LA, just uh, Lakeland, uh, just outside of LA, mm -hmm. walked into his house and he had a six foot by th three foot or four foot by four foot. And there were Jackson chameleons in there. And that I, I can remember so specifically, that was the moment that I went, I have to do that. I have to do this. 
the behavior was just so intense. And when I got back home within just a few months, I was keeping chameleons. First reptiles, let's keep some chameleons and learning right. process. And, you know, I was hooked, just hook, line and sinker. It was yeah. bad. I mean, the, they're, they're pretty impressive animals. I, I can't imagine seeing an animal. I, I can't imagine seeing some of the snakes and, and tortoises. I can't imagine seeing and geckos, I, but I can't imagine seeing chameleons in the wild. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about travel in just a second. But what what really got you hooked on herping? What what in your mind? What was the moment, or what was the experience that that got you? And maybe it was flipping boards. What brought you to the conclusion that you were a herper more than a keeper? If that makes sense. Um. Uh, I mean, I, I, I had always been uh, like a herper. I mean, in my mind, it was always like, I, I, t I talked, um, what did I do a podcast with, um, with, uh, Phil and Roy, I can't, they're, uh, herpeticulture, they've got a great podcast. Um, and I talked to them about, there being kind of like the the strange two like there's two avenues like there's multiple avenues but like in terms of like herping for me there was never any difference between like keeping reptiles and going out and looking for reptiles like that was all part of it there, there was no yeah it was like <clears throat> it was so weird to me once i found out that there was people who didn't go and look for reptiles i was like what do you mean like, what is that? What is like, what, what do you cook food and not eat it? Like, how does that work? Like, that's strange as hell to me. Like, this is all one thing. Like, you know, you keep reptiles when you're at home because you don't always have time to go and look for them. But when you have time, you damn sure go look for them. Like, what are you talking about? You've never gone and looked for reptiles like that. That came as a shock to me. Now I realize that it's actually a lot of people who keep reptiles, maybe because they can't, they don't have any time or, or, or whatever, whatever keeps them from being able to go and look for them. Um, but I think, I think just growing up and, and constantly doing that, um, like, you know, all my, I grew up with all my cousins, man, and we were just outside grubby little filthy kids, like flipping logs and climbing through bramble bushes and just getting beat up and falling out of trees and stuff. And like, it was just part of it. It was never, it was never like somebody was like, Hey, we, you know what, you should look under that log. Like, I don't even remember that. Like I was, I've been doing that for so long that I have no idea when that started. And to me, I mean, even to this day, anybody who, anybody who lives with like knows me day to day, they know, like my friends make fun of me we'll go on a hike with all the kids and they know any log is getting flipped. Like <laughs> regardless of what season it is, even I'm flipping it. And it's, it's just, just something that you have better. to do. Yeah. It's, I mean, obviously what's under there. Like, of course I'm not going to pass that log. Like, dude, there could be something under there. And um, I think what got me to like start wanting to travel and herp is, um, you know, reading these, read a lot of, a lot of books, man. You'll find through this podcast, I'm very, very, very into books. I have a huge library um, and I'm very into, uh, you know, herpetological books. And so, and I've always been into this. So ever since I was a kid, I've been getting books and I read books and I'll read them cover to cover, man. And I, I I'm very into them. Um, and so I would see these animals and just be like, yo, I, I don't think I'm ever going to see these animals in the pet trade because of the laws and jurisdictions or whatever. And so the only way I'm going to be able to go and see this animal is if I go to this country. And so I went on a family trip when I was younger, I think 16 or 18 to Costa Rica, which is a great first place to herp. And I went there and, and I just was finding, you know, red-eyed tree frogs which i you know they're very prevalent in magazines and books and i see a red-eyed tree frog for the first time in the wild and i'm just they're all over these plants man and i'm just like this is it this is amazing i don't ever want to that guy will never stop doing this this is so cool and then you know got back and immediately started planning another trip and it snowballed from there uh but but like you were saying at the very beginning of this podcast like close your eyes and imagine like you know, once you see these animals in the wild, it changes everything. Like it really does. It, 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 number one, it hooks you unless you're like a straight deadbeat, it hooks you and there's no getting away from it. 
like especially if you like you know you live and breathe reptiles like we do it's very it's something that's just very natural and being out there and looking for them and actually finding them and being like you know in in my mind man the dream of anybody keeping a crested gecko would not be to own a stupid exanthic crested gecko or these stupid <laughs> chino or whatever the dream of a crested gecko keeper would be to go to new caledonia and i don't know why i keep having to say that and and nobody's going like what like why aren't i seeing on these crested gecko forums photos of people's trips this is not pakistan this is not afghanistan it's not a war torn country like these people are making money hand over fist on these crested geckos why is nobody going to New Caledonia to see them, a wild one, and to have a vacation? Yo, this, this is not a, an ugly place to be. This is tropical, beautiful paradise, man, with wild cr crested geckos. What is happening? Like, where's the disconnect? I don't get it. It's insane to me. I've got a couple of points that, that you made me think of. I'm going to hold the first one, but the second one is, why do you think people don't? Pack their bags and just go. Just go. I, I, go honestly, there. I have no idea, man. I'm, I'm telling you that I don't have a clue. I've 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 done this spiel in front of people live. You've seen it. I've done this spiel in front of people face to face, like privately. I've told these people, man, and I'll I'll, I'll help people. Hit yo if you're if you're down and if you're real serious about going to New Caledonia, hit me up. I will show you exactly how to book a ticket how to do the things, how to figure out car rentals, how to search Google Earth for good places to go. I'll tell you all the things on how to do it. I can't go with you right now. I'm busy as hell, but I will help you to, to do it. If if there's people that are down, like if that's what they need, if they need this final, like if they're just worried, well, I don't know how to do it. It's far away and there's no guidebook on how to do it. It, you know, it's, it's like planning a damn family vacation, but instead of planning how you're going to go to Disneyland and where you're going to park, you know, you're fine. You're planning out how you're going to find crested geckos. The planning's fun. You get to look through, you know, super old historic documents of when people first found these animals. And like, I mean, there, there's so much, there's so much blood and just history involved in, in this side of the hobby that it's, it's so much more fun than keeping reptiles. It really is, man. You and I talked at the last gecko symposium, and you you threw it out there. You you challenged me, and I wasn't ready for it. We were talking geckos. We had like two or three minutes because you're busy, and I was running around. And hey, loved your your talk after you know you had spoken at the gecko symposium. Loved your talk, and and I asked a question or something like, "Oh, what do you?" And you said, "Go, go, yeah." And, and I, but I in I started in my mind I started thinking well the family finances time time away from the animals uh, we all have a big all, I, I, in my mind I was thinking of a hundred reasons and I could see in the look on your face stop yeah. don't don't you're, do just, that. you're only you're talking yourself out of it I, you're not talking me out of it I'm going you're talking <laughs> yourself out of your own trip like you could tell me all the reasons you want. But trust me, I have this. I have all of those exact excuses. I got a massive collection. I've got two young children. I have a huge family around here. I have three or four different jobs. I got a million things to do. I'm leaving next week. Like, you got to make it happen, dude. And the wonderful thing about geckos is they don't need daily care. That's the beautiful thing about geckos. They need, that's, you know, that's spot on, man. They can, they can, I mean, I, I'm not going to get, I don't want somebody to freaking cancel me, but like I, they can go five days without nothing. You got to miss, especially if you have a misting system going, turn the temperatures down a hair, have the mister going, like, you know, make sure your mist king is running, dude. And you got five days, hundred percent, even more with crested geckos where you can put the little goop in their cage and just do what you're going to do. Just like a bowl, like a like a big cereal bowl full. Yeah, it's of like leaving them. Yeah, and walk away. Exactly. You know, walk People away. leave their cats at home like that all the time. Put a yeah. bowl of cat food and go on your vacation. I tell you what, right here, I'm not disagreeing with that whatsoever, and it's not on purpose. But I've had a, an enclosure that I thought was empty that turns out that there was a baby, <laughs> eggs hatch, babies. Man, I haven't had the parents in this tank for a month. And here are the babies hatch out, and they're doing just fine. And I know that they're three, go. four weeks old. How does that happen? Well, it happens in nature, right? It happens really? in nature. Did you feed crickets today? I did feed crickets. <laughs> Why? Can you hear them in the background? I can hear them. Yep. 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 
you were talking about the crusted geckos and just going and observing and why would somebody do the whole um you know cappuccino lily white times exam all of this stuff instead of just observing um a couple of things there one man it's and you mentioned that it was hard for you to fathom why why somebody wouldn't just pick up and go and i hear i i see questions um, here's a great one. Let me give you a really specific example. Facebook. Hey, my gecko isn't eating insects. Um, is there anything, is there a better diet to feed than name a diet? Pangea. Or, I want to find, feed a different diet because my animals won't eat, eat insects. In my mind, it, it's hard for me to fathom, you know, why are you not asking what happens in nature? Why are you not asking, do you think that they just eat? diet or fruit, nectar, fruit, blah, blah, blah. Or do you think that they're just eating insects and not eating, stop feeding whatever you're feeding and see what happens. And so it's hard for me not to get on there and blah, 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 just hammer at the keyboard and say, stop asking people and think about what happens in nature. Mm -hmm. Just like you're saying, you know, it's hard for you to imagine why people are spending a lot of money. And I, I completely agree with you. There's a lot of money being thrown around for all of these different, let me try this. Let me try that. Instead of just going, pick it up and, and go. Or just, to, just as like a supplement, just being like, yo, I'm, I'm the king of crested geckos. I've, I've bred them and I've got all these wild morphs and all this crazy stuff. And it's like, what, you know, how do I level up? Dude, you go. That's how you level up, knucklehead. Like, go. Like, how do you, what do you mean? How do I level up? Like, be the guy who went. Be the ultimate guy. Be the guy that can answer the questions because you've been there, because you found one. Keep your mind open. Open your mind to that, what's happening in nature, right? Straight up. Hey, if anybody has questions, post them in the chat. I I have a couple of questions already. I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold back to them but please post your questions in the chat so i think getting back to why people don't go i think that you know money time energy experience you know there's a lot of different factors um that people will just like you said will use as an excuse in their mind to not go mm -hmm. um if after you've traveled a couple of times does it just become second nature are all of the and I'm going to follow that up with, you know, kind of a, a, a related question. What are people, I'm afraid of going. Wally's afraid of going. What What's stopping Wally? Um, I'm just un, unsure of the unknown. What's a couple of things that, so number one, is it second nature now for you to just pack up and go? And number two, what are some of the things that maybe Wally's worried about that really he should not worry about in traveling to Belize or, or, or Yemen or, or Australia or whatever. Well, I mean, it, it, it all, like that's super, you know, um, situational. Yeah. There's, there's plenty to be worried about if you're going to travel to Yemen. Like that's not a good idea at all. Um, that's a <laughs> terrible idea. So yes, you're, you're in your right mind to be worried about <laughs> traveling to Yemen. Um, so, so it all depends on where you're going to go. And that's kind of why we're like blasting crested geckos instead of leopard geckos is because leopard gecko people have an excuse. Pakistan's not the most friendly place. Um, Afghanistan is not the most friendly place. Turkey is fine. Um, you can find them there. So there's, I mean, you know, if there was a leopard gecko fanatic who really wanted to go find them in the wild, you could do it. But for the most part, leopard geckos are in some pretty hostile territory. Um, you know, th so there's definitely some countries that you can't go to, but places like you know like a like a felsuma psycho who wants to just know everything about felsumas it's like well dude what's the next step obviously go to madagascar and see felsuma uh the new caledonia guys i just use them they're the scapegoat because there's just so many of them um and to me it's like you know go to hawaii to see you know giant geckos it's like new caledonia is so tropical and so amazing Australians, basically, that's their Hawaii. They go there nonstop because it's beautiful. It's just absolutely awesome. And that's the other thing is it's like, so New Caledonia is a French territory. So the language there is French. So that would be one thing that's that's a little bit sketchy. Yeah. It's, um, 
it's, you know, well, what, well, what if I don't know the language? Well, what if you don't know the language? Who cares? Big deal. You're going to be, what are you going to be doing? Like, you're not going to be talking to people that often. You're going to be out in the forest looking for geckos. You can figure out a way to, to tell somebody, Hey, I need a room or, Hey, I want to rent a car or, Hey, I, I want, you know, scrambled eggs, whatever. Like, it, I mean, you might have a little bit of trouble, but big, it's not dangerous. It's, you don't know the language, but at the same time, a lot of Australians go there. So most people working in the hospitality industry are going to speak a little bit of some sort of English because that's like an Australian vacation spot, which is great about that whole South Pacific area is the Australians are right there. So they hit a lot of these places and familiarize those places with English and with, you know, quote unquote, white people. So it's not quite so scary to go there. So it, it all depends on like, I guess what your fears would be. I mean, you, fear the unknown, like that's the fear should turn into more of like, you know, like wonder, like, like what is the unknown? Dude, that's the funnest part. I've never been here. Like, it's amazing. Like the first time I went to Africa, the first time I went to the Middle East or the first time I was anywhere is, is so much more amazing per se than the second time, because it's, you've never been there. You don't have no clue what to expect. And that's like the funnest part not having any clue what to expect that, you know, the second and the third and the fourth and the eighth and the 10th time you've been somewhere, you know what to expect. You've got a goal to accomplish. Like for me in South Africa, I've been there tons of times and it's like something you're keeping like, okay, you know, we're here to find Pachydactylus oreophilus. I know exactly where we're going. We're going to, we're going to land in Johannesburg. We're going to fire straight up to Windhoek. We're going to go further North. We're going to go to Sesfontaine. We're going to get this room and we're going to find oreophilus. Like that's the goal. But the very first time I went there, it, everything's new. So it, you're just like, oh, my gosh, I don't have any targets. Everything is a target. And that's the most fun is everything is a target. So like if I was to go to New Caledonia, I've not been to New Caledonia. If I was to go, I really wouldn't even like I, I would check the old records and stuff and find out kind of where things were found. And I might, you know, email some of my some of my buddies who've been there and some scientists that I know have been there and get some locations. But I mean, everything is new. All the little bavias you're going to find, all the urodactyloides, all the, you know, anything that you find is going to be new. And so it's going to be exciting no matter what. Dude, even if you strike out and you don't find a crested gecko, which very well might happen considering they weren't found for, you know, almost a hundred years. Who cares? I guarantee you found other stuff, amazing stuff. So the fear part, it, yes, it's a small speed bump, but it should also, it, it should, besides being a speed bump, I mean, it should be gas in the tank. That should be fun. And if, and, and you know, honestly, if you don't have, if that isn't gas in your tank, if that doesn't make you excited, maybe it's not for you. Maybe, you know, you're, maybe you need to sit home and just sit on your couch and feed your lizards. I don't know. <laughs> and, and and then that says, but there's snakes over there, and they're big, and there's snakes. What do you I mean know what you're saying, but I know what you're going to say. What? What are you talking about? We're looking for those. Like that's what people. That's what. That's another thing that just trips me what out is when people who are into like geckos don't. They're just like snakes are not reptiles. Are you tr are you crazy? This is all no one thing, dude. No. We're if you're into reptiles, you're into reptiles. Mm -mm. Going back to Reptilian Diaries, that's what I love about that is that even on your trips looking for geckos, you're finding this and you're finding that and you're finding that and you're excited and you're... Well, because I'm looking for reptiles and I'm looking for amphibians. Geckos are my thing. Lizards and geckos are my thing, but reptiles are my thing. So it's like, you know, it's like eating a cupcake and really enjoying, you know, the, the sprinkles on the top. Like I want the whole cupcake, but I really like the sprinkles. So I'm eating everything but I enjoy one thing, you know, super much. It's, it's, it trips me out, man. And that's, that's what I like my, if I was to be able to change anything in this, in this space, that's what it would be. It would just be, everybody is into the whole, the whole sphere of reptiles, not just reptile keeping, not just herping, just everybody is just into it all. And I mean, and I think that, and, and I think that not getting out, and, and I'm, I'm pointing to myself and, and talking to myself, I think that not getting out and herping and taking some of these trips and just seeing what's out there does put us back in those silos. I'm a gecko person. Mm -hmm. I'm a knobtail person. I'm a banded gecko person. I, I don't care about those other geckos. I, I'm a crusty gecko person. 
Mm. So in, in my mind, you know, I've expanded a little bit, and at least I'm not a crusty gecko person. I'm not accusing or, or putting anybody down. I'm just saying that that you know, in my mind, I can see you know branching out from crusteds and leopards and trying something different. But but I know you'll say, Wally, there's so much more than just geckos. There's so much more than geckos. There is, dude. There's so much more. I mean. There's so much more. I mean, just, and you don't even have to branch out that far from geckos. Just go to lizards. Just go to lizards. you got thousands of species. Thousands. I mean, you don't even have to play with snakes yet. I love snakes. I don't have a lot of snakes. I have what? One, two, three, four. I have five snakes and hundreds of geckos and lizards. But my snakes, they're awesome. They're great snakes. And I love them. And I, I've never been a guy that kept a lot of snakes. Um. I don't know what it is about them. I, for some reason, I get kind of bored of keeping them. But when you're in the wild, like finding snakes is almost like the, the cream of the, like the tip of the, like that, the, that's the thing. That's the pinnacle is you want to find snakes. Okay. The snakes are like the most impressive thing to find, you know, like, so, so I'm a gecko and I'm a lizard guy, but like, you know, if I'm in Oman and I'm sitting there finding uh, Prosterus cartery, which is the scorpion, scorpion, whatever they, scorpion gecko. But then, you know, then I see a, a nausea arabicus, which is an Arabian cobra. It's like, screw the freaking gecko, dude. Look at the cobra. You know what I mean? Like, no, and that's how it is. And that's how it is everywhere. Honestly, like I've been in plenty of places. I've been in Belize and there's, you know, we're finding Coleonyx um, mitratus on this trail and then we come up and there's a, a lampropeltis a, a, a no. milk snake and it's like i've completely forgot about all the geckos even though at home i want nothing to do with a milk snake but i want all the coleonics so it's it's it flips and it's way way interesting to find to find snakes in the wild compared to you know geckos are also rad but snakes are just they're just they're they're farther and fewer between and they're just so impressive so impressive like, so impressive. I mean, in Australia, like finding, I found a 10 foot olive python and it was the most impressive. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen. Stretched across the road. It's so oh. big that we didn't even think it like, it looked like a rope or something. It, it, there was no way that that, that that was really a snake, but it, it was a heat all the way across the road. And what kind was that? I'm sorry. It was an olive oh, python. Oh. Mm -mm. And I mean, finding that blew away finding Strophorus ciliaris and heteronosia and any of those knobtails. Awesome no, <laughs> no way. You're in the car. You're stuck. You're coming. What? You got another 12 days ahead of you. Nope. You're to the airport. You're dreaming. <laughs> <laughs> nope. It, it's, it's hard because I know how much Nanette is not a snake person. So that would be really, really tough. On the other hand, though, get me out in the I wild and I'm putting like up. Either. What's that? I said my wife's not a big snake person either. Not at all. She's not. She's not like terrified she of them. She's traveling she's not, with like, you though. Oh, let me. Yeah, she's been. To, she was. Uh, wasn't she in the? Yeah, she was in Oman with me. She was in Ecuador with me. She was. She's been to Mexico with me. She's been on quite a few reptile trips, like legitimate reptile trips, like not just vacation trips. You're piquing my interest because you're naming all these spots, and I want to get back to the reptiles, but really quick, name off some of the spots. And I know you've done this a little bit here, but if you can, try to name off the, the, the uh, destinations that you've been to, Frank, if you wouldn't mind, to give people a perspective. Okay. Um, I've been almost – I mean, I've been, I've been to all the continents except for Antarctica – um, I have not been to like Southeast Asia at all, but I have done all over Europe. I've done Australia. I've done all over Southern Africa. I've done Senegal on the West coast of Africa. I've done, um, Ecuador and South America. I've done Costa Rica, Belize, Guatemala, um, Mexico. I've done most of the Caribbean. I have done... What else does that leave? Oh, the Middle East. I've done Oman and I've done uh, Qatar and I've done uh, the United Arab Emirates. And do, 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 the United States, of course. And I think that's about it. I mean, that's it's it's a decent amount. Wow. I've been most places except like I haven't done anything in Southeast Asia. Nothing. 
Nothing Why at all. Not? Why not? Not been to Thailand, not been to Japan, Taiwan, nothing. Just haven't yet. Okay. There's no reason why I haven't yet. I mean, there's there's a there's a kind of a pecking order. There's things I want to see, and there's just they've come first. And also just like you know, opportunity. Like who's going where? Um, do I have friends that want to go here? Like a lot of times friends will hit me up and just say, Hey, are you, do you want to do this? And I'll be like, Yeah, and they'll be like, Okay, let's plan it. And I'll be like, let's plan it. And so we'll plan it. Like with Australia. Um, my buddy who saw him was interested in going and he was like, would you have interest in going? I'd be like, yeah, let's plan one. And so we planned it and we spent close to a year planning that trip. Um, talking to different people who had been there and, you know, just going through every single field guide, Google earth, this, that, the other thing. And that's kind of how these trips start. It's just a lot of research. Um, my buddy Greg goes on a lot of trips with me. And I mean, I was doing trips long before we had like, you know, maps on your phone and stuff like that. I still have this old big thick book, this map book from Africa. That's just, just torn up and so used. And I love, I'll never get rid of that thing because it's been on probably six or seven South Africa, Southern Africa trips. And it's just all beat up and it's got all kinds of notes and stuff. And it's pretty <clears throat> neat. Um, nowadays it's much easier because you got your phone and it generally works in most countries and you can just figure out where you're going. I mean, back in the day, it was like looking at a Thomas guide, like a map, flipping the pages a5 damn it gotta look at the you know going through all these maps trying to figure out where you're at not really knowing where you are you never had the blue dot where you could be like oh there we are you'd be like i think we're over here like i don't know where we're at on this map trying to figure out where you're going <clears throat> so honestly back back in like the the you know 20 2006 2008 2010 those years you really had to do some serious research for these trips and, you know, I'm talking like write things down and do all kinds, you know, you'd have a notebook of, of notes when you get there. And nowadays it's just all, you know, I mean, I'll still do some research and stuff, but you just get there, you're on your phone and you just, it's easy. On those earlier trips, you have everything, I don't want to say everything mapped out, but you've done your research. You have little dots on your map, I'm guessing. Yeah, we have How species accurate. that we want to see. Yeah. And how accurate was that information back then? Did you get to places and go, I might as well throw this book out because nothing is the same. I'm not finding any of the animals or. I've definitely like, um, so Google earth has been around a long time and I've utilized Google earth, man, I don't want to say 20 years, but I almost want to say 20 years. Like it's been a long time. I've been using Google earth and I would zoom in on places and really like be like, oh my gosh, this place is gonna be so lit. Like this is it. We're gonna this is gonna be so good. And I'd get there and either it's been completely like bulldozed and it's gone, or just I get there and I can't get in. Like there's no road, like there's a gate. The worst thing is there's a gate and you just can't get there. And you just wasted so much time. Um I've I've done but yeah, there's been plenty of times where I've gotten to a spot and just got skunked, just got smoked, nothing. Whether And sometimes I get there, the spot's dope, everything's fine, it works out perfect, and I, and I but I don't find the animal, and I just strike out. Other times I get there, and the spot, like I said, is, is totally changed, or I get lost, or there's a gate, or, you know, you get there, and there's it's private property, and people kick you out, or whatever. Um, or I've also, like a lot of these, you know, a lot of these more primitive... Not, I wouldn't say primitive, but just less developed countries. A lot of them shut down really early and you got to be aware of that. Um, I've been definitely stranded multiple times where, you know, you come from the U S and you're just, you're thinking, no, nah, gas stations are 24 hours. You know, there's good, there's a, of course there's gotta be a best Western. No, there's none of that. And gas stations are not 24 hours and your ass will get, you will, I've, you'll sleep on the road on, on the side of the road because you don't have enough gas to get to a big town where the gas stations are 24 hours and the small town's gas station closed and you're, you're stuck. Like we did that in Australia. We had to sleep on the road, just pulled over to the side of the road, popped a tent and um, had to camp and wait until the morning and then jam over to the gas station and get gas. And that stuff happens a lot. And it's also happened where like all the restaurants are closed and you can't eat and you're like scraping chips off of the freaking floorboards of the car. Cause you're starving and, or you don't, you have nowhere to sleep. Like you didn't get a room. And so that's a thing like for me now, I'm pretty good about when I get there, 
if I if I don't have a place lined up, which I, I about 50 percent of the time, depending on where I am, if I've been there before and I know the ins and outs of the country yeah. pretty well, um, I'll plan accordingly, you know, like Oman in the Middle East. They just they, those people don't ever sleep or if they are asleep, they'll wake up and come out. And so you don't need to book a hotel there. You can find your place and their gas stations are 24 hours. But Australia, for instance, they shut down. South Africa shuts down. Namibia totally shuts down. A lot of these Central American and South American countries pretty much shut down. Like Ecuador would shut down. So a lot of these places, you need to have your basic necessities lined up before you go herp. Have your room, have your water, have your food, then go reptile hunt. Make sure you take care of that stuff and then hit the trails. Are you doing a lot of that when you... Are you, I'm sorry. Are you doing a lot of that when you arrive? When you arrive, it's like, okay, we've got to get the room, or maybe you're doing that beforehand. But at least when you arrive, you're you're kind of putting together your food and your water. Or when I arrive in the town, like when I arrive into the town that I'm going to, yeah, like what, where I'm closest to be. Like for example, what I brought up earlier, like with Oreophilus and like Sesfontaine or or Apimbi or whatever whatever town I'm going to be in up there in northern Namibia central northern Namibia, those are small, small, I mean, one intersection, dusty huts in town, like barely a town, usually one gas station, maybe a tire shop, and that's it. Um, and so, and it may be a couple guest houses, but you need to pull into that town well before dark, well before even 6 p.m. You need to be getting in there at three o'clock, hit the gas station, make sure you've got gas, get, you know, Meat pies are big in Africa. They should be big here. They're so good. It's like 7-Eleven food, but they're so good. Um, but yeah, get your gas, get your water, talk to the people at the gas station about a guest house. They'll they'll know somebody. They'll give you a phone number. Hit those people up, line it up, go meet them, pay them, get the keys, then go reptile hunt. That way nothing's working. You're not worrying about anything. You're out there. You're not tripping on, oh my gosh, dude, where are we going to stay tonight? Don't try to camp the whole time either. It's, it sucks. Don't even do that. Get yourself rooms. Get yourself a bed, get yourself a warm shower. Because when you're beat up and you're filthy and you're sleeping on the ground, you're just not going to be good at reptile hunting. Yeah. You're going to be tired and upset and just annoyed. You want to you want to find your animals, be able to stay up late taking photos and stuff like that, be able to release your animals and then come back to the house, party with your buddies, have some beers, sleep in a bed, take a warm shower, sleep in, wake up, have coffee and not be sleeping in a tent on the ground. That sucks. People try to say, oh, it's so rad. It sucks. It's terrible. And I'm, maybe I'm 43, and that's why it sucks, but it sucks. I've done it plenty of times. I love camping. I don't like camping while reptile hunting. It's garbage. I'll get a hotel every time. Nanette was asking before. She, you had mentioned, you know, I've been here, 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 and here, and here, and here. And Nanette goes, I, did, I don't know if you heard her or not, but she said, he's not that old. He shouldn't be going to all these spots already. Pretty old. Um, you don't look that. 43, man. 1980. 43? Oh, oh no. Well, I graduated in what? 81? <laughs> I, I, I graduated in aught eight, I feel like. Well, it's all relative. You guys it can is get out relative. Like you said in the very beginning, as long as you're young here, that's all that's that matters. Right. It's fine. Please, yeah. everybody, if you have questions, load them up. Load them up. You mentioned all these spots, Frank. I mean, maybe I missed it, but and I know now would not be the time to go, but have you ever considered Russia? Was there a point early on yeah. where you were considering going to Russia? China? We were actually, well, we, we knew. So me and my buddy Mickey, who I traveled to Oman with, he is one of my big, like, very close friend. And um, he he's an inspiration as well as hopefully I inspire him as well. Like he's just he's one of my he's one of my great friends. We travel together where we have a lot of fun together. Um, and we know a scientist from Russia and we were finding some new species of tropioclotas in Oman. So we were going to work with the scientist on describing those species. And we were going to go to St. Petersburg and visit the museum where he works and, and help with this stuff. And then kind of the Russia stuff happened and that kind of ended that. Um, in terms of herping Russia, yeah, Southwestern Russia would be rad. Um, yeah. And like the stands, you know, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, 
uh, though there's some really good herping in those areas. There's, um, you know, a lot of Cirtopodia and Mediodactylus and, and different geckos down there. There's Teratoskinkus. And yeah, China, if I was going to do China, I would, I would prefer to do, you know, extreme Western China, um, where like the Uyghur people are and where all that stuff's going down. Um, because that's where all the geckos are. I mean, you, I mean, you have geckos in, in like tropical and, and subtropical China, you've got different hemiphylodactylus and gecko species and, um, you know, you've got your Goniosaurus and stuff like that. But for me, I'm more interested in deserts. I do love forests and jungles like that. But right off the bat, like when I first think like, oh, I want to go somewhere, it's generally like, it's usually all about one species of gecko for the most part. And then seeing, well, what, what's the collateral stuff that I can find? So like, I was really actually really into Western China for a while. I was like, um, I'm trying to remember like the, what is the name of that area that I wanted to even go? The, that is the Urupan Depression, which is in Western China. So this is where Tretaskinkus Preswalski and also Tretaskinkus Robarowski are in the, from this area. And there's also Alsophylax, which is a little small gecko that's kind of like Tropiocolotus. And I, I really wanted to go to this area because I, I I hadn't seen anybody's trip reports from this area. And it's like, you know, nobody's been over there. Let's run it. Let's go. But then I, then I, you know, did a lot of research and then I found that in, so one of the main reasons I haven't been to China, this is it, is you cannot rent a car in China. You have to have a Why? driver and I'm not into that. That's not my oh. style. Um, I really, I, I do it occasionally, but I, I don't want to do it. Yeah. And so I just, it just didn't make sense. I was like, man, trying to like, what is he going to drop me off in the desert and then come back again? I mean, it's just, a, it's a pain in the ass. And that's actually why I haven't done Madagascar as well. Cause you can't rent a car there. Uh, oh. so that's a problem for me. Yeah. Uh, but so yeah, the Urupan in China, um, Southern Russia, good stuff there. I still will eventually probably do like Uzbekistan cause that Russian scientist was going to meet us there in Uzbek and show us some, some really cool stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of that stuff, it's just like, man, that's, it's a lot of work to get into those countries just with the visas and there's just a lot of bureaucratic stuff. And then it's also sketchy that those, those bring up kind of pro like worries for me in terms of like, people are going to be following you around. People are going to really want to know what you're doing. Language barrier is going to be weird when people are asking you what you're doing. And those people are known for like locking up Americans thinking they're spies <laughs> for like 50 years. So those kind of worries do come up when, when we're talking about those like kind of Eastern Bloc countries and, and uh, Russia. So like for now, I, that's kind of very much on the back burner. There's a lot of other countries, Turkey, for example, um, Armenia, for example, like there's plenty of a kind of Eastern European slash Asian countries that really have a lot of nice geckos. Um, Greece, even that are that are pretty safe, perfectly safe. Some per pretty safe others that I could go to. And also there's a lot of Middle Eastern countries that I still kind of want to do. Like I want to do Jordan. I want to do Lebanon. Um, I haven't done those. Um I mean, Jordan has a really, really cool Teodactylus, which are the fan-footed geckos. So there's, uh, I mean, there's, there's plenty of places to go. There's just, I'm, I'm trapped in the childhood raising moment right now, but soon it will change. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be making videos again and I'll be back out there. Do you see, you know, you just mentioned the, the childhood years and, you know, your attention certainly should and does go to your kids and priorities and everything like that. But do you see while you're going through the next 10 years or so, do you see yourself making, a, you know, probably less frequent, but occasional trips abroad? Absolutely. I'm, I'm yeah. counting down the days, man. Like I'm, uh, I mean, when we had, so when, when me and my wife had our first baby, I, I kind of kept the, the travel ball was still rolling. I mean, one is one is one, two is 30. So it was, it was easy with one. I, I don't want to say it was easy, but it was just like, I could get away with one with two. It's just too much. It's too much. And so I really have to plan um, when I want to go away. And plus also me, just my heart too. It's like, I miss my kids now. Like back in the right. day, man, I'd go away for, 
I'd go away for three weeks. I'd go spend 25 days in Africa. There's no way that I would do that now. Like nowadays, my limit is about 10 days. And then I'm like, yo, I'm ready to go. Like, I, I want to go see my family. And 10 days is plenty. 10 days is enough to go anywhere. You know, you got a day and a half travel. You get there. You got seven or eight days on the ground. Like if you can't get something rolling in that amount of time, then just go home, get, hang it up. Like that should be plenty of time. So 10 days for me is is kind of my, that's what I do these days. You're saying seven days is enough instead of 20 or, or 45 or whatever. Seven days is enough. Walk us through, Frank. Okay, walk Wally through. Hey, hey Frank, I want to go to, I don't know, pick a place. I want to go to Madagascar. Walk okay. me through four or five things. Hey, Wally, don't you need to really spend your time looking at this one thing. Wally, make sure you do this. Wally, make sure you take this. Walk me through four or five of those kinds of thoughts that you would you would share with me. Well, like, so for Madagascar, you know, you're going to fly into Tana, which is kind of in the north central part of the country. You have to have a guide. You have to have a driver. And so your best. Th so so those kind of trip. This is where the planning comes into play. You want to plan your trip, not to the T, because things are always going to go sideways and it's never yes. going to work to the T. So loosely plan your trip what do you want to see do you want to see felsuma do you want to see Europlatus? do you want to see blazodactylus do you want to see paroidura do you want to see chameleons do you want to see radiated tortoises like lemurs what is, what do you want to see first of all i'm i'm sorry you said periodora and, and i i i'm not you're listening lost. anymore yeah i'm not listening anymore so he wants to see paroidura okay so then you're going to be in the north for the most part cuz that's where most of them are so Find out, you know, which species you want to see, you, you know, Picta or, or Lahatsara or Vizimba or whatever you want to see. Find out what area you can go to to see the most in one stop, right? Make that one of your stops. And I know you'd want to see Picta or I'd hope you'd want to see Picta. So make that one of your stops. I don't know exactly where they're at because I haven't gone and looked for them. But so go see Picta. Go find another centrally located spot to see a, a, a good handful of species. Go see a couple other things and get out of there. Try to plan things ahead of time. You want to make sure you plan things ahead of time. Yep. At least knowing like, okay, when I go here, there's a good chance I can stay here. When I go here, there, I heard there's a guest house here. Talk to people who have been. There's actually, there's actually a lot of reptile people who've gone to Madagascar. So talk to them. Ask them about where you can stay, things like that. Get a good idea. The first trip is always the one that kind of is is – it's amazing, but it, it's also, it's scary and it's nerve wracking and you waste time and because you're just, it's your first time there. Your second and third trip, you can really dial things in and just run it. But the first trip is always a little bit sketchy. Um, and yeah, you do waste time regardless, whether you want to or not. That's just the way it goes. But with Madagascar, yeah, man, line up your driver, make sure he knows you're looking for reptiles, find your spots where you want to go, look for national parks and go like it's that easy you fly to johannesburg you transfer from johannesburg to antananarivo your guy meets you at the airport and you hit the ground running dude save up some airline points and get yourself a business class ticket so you can sleep on the plane so you're not just wiped out by the time you get there there you go what what is wally going to waste most of his time doing that his second trip he's not going to do that again and he's just going to jump in with both feet you'll know where to stay um, and you'll know, you'll kind of know, hopefully you'll understand what their kind of their style is of booking. Are you able to just show up and book? Can you show up that day? Do you need to waste time at home dealing with that? Or can you pull up on a Tuesday evening at six o'clock and just walk in and be like, I'm staying. And they're like, damn right. Cool. Like, how's that going to work? And the, the national parks that you go to, do you pull up park and walk in? Or is it a whole thing? Some of these places are ridiculous. You pull up, you wait, they want to see your passport. You want freaking, they want you to do a damn strip search. Like there's ridiculous stuff going on. So you learn all these things the first time. <laughs> Sometimes there's these big national parks, man, you pull up and you just go in. There's nobody even there. And other times it's like a real big deal. Um, your driver, was he reliable? Did he show up? Did he pick you up when he was supposed to? Did he drop you off? Did he speak English? Was he nice? Was he funny? Was he rad? Was he terrible? Like, there's a lot of things that you learn on your first trip and, you know, you tinker with these things on your second, or maybe you hated Madagascar and you don't go back. 
maybe you got malaria and you don't ever want to go back there. Like, you know, you never know what's going to happen on these trips. Um, somebody mentioned, uh, I've got to share this one real quick. Um, <clears throat> Houseman said, if there are a lot of flies, bring a head net. I'm sure there's little things like that for that's every who saw him. Trip. That's my buddy. <laughs> He's talking crazy because Australia was absolutely beyond comprehension. So people tell you there's a lot of flies. And if anyone's listening to this and you're planning on going to Australia, you <clears throat> will, there's more flies than you think. It's insane. Way more flies than you think. So just be ready for that. And bring a head if you want to wear one. They're a pain in the ass, but you may want to wear one. One of my guilty pleasures is that I'll flip through the channels, and if uh, Naked and Afraid is on, I'll stop. And I'll watch that and say, well, when I was younger, I, I could have done that. I could have done that. But I tell you what, the bugs, the constant swarms of flies, I don't know if that's something that would uh, – that's something that, you know, I'm tapping. Day five, I'm tapping, man. These flies just are. So I'm thinking there's going to be some things like that that you you don't anticipate that are just going to knock you down so bad. Um, have you ever had something like that? Uh, heat, uh, raining all the time, something that's just like this stinks. I don't know if I would do this again in in this location. Um, no, dude. I'm in my paradise, man. I, I am in my <laughs> element. Like I, I went to, so I went to Belize one time and it, I was there for 14 days and it rained 14 of those days. It was brutal. Really? And I loved it. I don't care. Like I'm there, I'm in the rainforest. Do I expect it not to rain in the rainforest? I don't know. Like, I, I don't think I, I'm ready for it, man. I'm there to herp. I'm there to, to, I mean, you know, so if you're, if you're, if you're thinking you're going to like bring your wife on some, herp trip and she's going to just have some glamorous little trip and you're going to be able to skirt off into the jungle to get reptiles. It's not happening, dude. Like you either do a vacation and you kind of, you know, herp the parking lot, which I see tons of guys doing and acting like they went on some herp trip. And it's like, no, you didn't. You saw an iguana in the parking lot of your resort. That's not herping. Or you tell your wife, look, you can come, but it's going to be brutal. Or you can stay home and I'll take you on the next trip and we won't do a herp trip. We'll do more of a vacation trip. But you can't, uh, you kind of can't mix those mix those two things very often. I mean, there, there's occasional places where you can, and it also depends on your on your spouse. Yeah. I should say because there's a lot of women reptile keepers, so it depends. Your husband too might be, might be the guy who's uh, the problem <laughs> in this equation. But your spouse needs to understand what's happening on the trip, and if they have different ideas of why you're going on this trip, you're going to have problems. Um. But for me personally, man, there's if I'm on a reptile trip, unless I get thrown in jail or something like that or deathly sick, nothing is is taking my stoke away. I'm I'm there for it. I'm happy to be there. If it's raining, I'll find frogs, man. It, it so. sounds like you go back to exactly what you've been saying all along. Plan, research, plan, look for a contingency, but plan and know what you're walking into rather than going and saying, Oh my gosh, the bugs are suck here. So I don't like this. Yeah. You got to know, you got to know what you're doing, know what you're going into. Look at the weather patterns. I mean, you don't need to go super, super crazy, but at least glance, you know, the, the internet's a wonderful thing. Use it, use the internet, type it in weather in Costa Rica in, uh, in late March and see what it's going to be like. That way you can plan. Um, you know, you don't want to go in the middle of the dry season to Costa Rica looking for certain frogs that are only out in the wet season. Like, and that's the other thing. So you, you want to check the general parameters of the country. And then you also need to be nailing down your micro habitats or you're going to go to the country and it's going to be amazing. But you're not going to find anything because things don't just pop up in parking lots like you have to go look for them and you have to know what you're looking for or you won't find it at all. Not that this is any, and don't, people don't get me wrong here. I know Frank is going through a lot of planning and a lot of preparation, and this is nowhere even close. But, you know, we were taking, when we were younger, we were taking the kids up to Canada going fishing. So in a little tiny bit of a way that resembles what you're doing as far as we would plan. And I would look at spots and I would prepare, can we take bait up? Can we take worm and things like that? Um, I, I, somebody mentioned, you know, uh, pay a guide company. Uh, 
so when we would go fishing, the very first thing that I would do, the very first day, I'm going to hire a guide and I'm going to have them take me to two or three spots that I can catch fish on. And from there, I can kind of walk through that whole process myself. Um, so I, I think the key, the key there, my point is a lot of planning, a lot of preparation, know what you're walking into. Right. I have a bunch of questions already. And that was that Folks, was Sean, that was Sean Harrington who doesn't he doesn't know anything about herping, so he has to use guides. Yeah. <laughs> he, he needs it sounds like he needs to hire you and you need to to uh I've got a bunch of questions. Sean, Sean knows them. Them. <laughs> um Nanette, do you want to do the questions? And folks, if you have questions, leave your questions in. We're going to hit a couple of questions and we're going to get right back into the main topic here. Nanette? Yeah. <clears throat> What's the most dangerous? Let me just move the question. I can't see it now. What's the most dangerous place and country you've ever gone herping? Ooh, good question. I mean, that depends. Like, that really depends on the time and the place when I went. Like, I've, I've, I've been herping in South Africa many, many times. Um, and that place is super volatile. Right now, it's pretty bad. When I went, it was pretty mellow. Um, still, though, it's a very, very dangerous place. And the people who live there actually kind of flaunt how dangerous it is. They, like, love it. It's all they talk about. Mm -hmm. They just, like, they love to talk about crime. It's funny. <laughs> it's crazy stories they tell you, and they're really cool people, but they just love talking about it. So South Africa is a pretty <laughs> wild spot. Um, I've been to the Omani-Yemen border, which is it was safe for us to be there, but Yemen is an incredibly dangerous place to be um, right now. And so when you're there, there's a lot of military. They're checking your passport constantly. Um, we found like unexploded ordinances near this base that we, it was pretty wild. We actually shot one of them off and it was not a smart thing to do. But it was really funny. They're like, I actually have it on video. Um, and yeah, we've, we've done some pretty crazy stuff like that. Parts of Mexico have, have, we're safe and now dangerous. Um, so yeah, man, there's, there's, uh, I mean, I guess that would be most, I mean, every, every time, every place has its, has its moment. I was herping in Trinidad and Tobago and that year Trinidad was actually the number one country in murders per capita, I guess. So I guess that's very dangerous, but I felt totally safe there the whole time. Um, so, I mean, yeah, if that's danger, I mean, I'm getting myself into dangerous situations a lot of times, especially in Africa, there's, there's lions, there's venomous snakes, there's real dangers that they're not people, but they can literally kill you. Um, in Oman, there's deadly vipers, there's poisonous scorpions. There's a lot of things that can wreck you. But if you're, you know, I'm there, I'm there to see that kind of stuff. So it doesn't necessarily frighten me, but yeah, that's, those are probably I mean, I, I guess that would that would probably be my best answer to that question. And, and you know, when when I brought that that uh, question up on the screen, I was thinking exactly that that from a political standpoint, mm -hmm. but from an animal standpoint, have you been face to face? I, I'm going to kind of tag onto that. Have you been face to face with? Yeah, this this is bad. This is really bad. And I thank goodness I was thinking about this beforehand and prepared, or or yeah. you know. We've had some some stuff happen. I mean, I could go on and on, but yeah, there was there's times in Africa where we've seen leopards and we've been too close to lions. And so when we're in Africa, we don't have guides, we don't have guns. It's us in a car out in the cut. And for the most part, lions, especially in South Africa, there's there, there's no wild lions. Um, but if you're up in northern Namibia, there are wild lions. And so we've been up looking for different tenopus species and keoko gecko and, and pachydactylus and, and those. And yeah, you'll hear lions super close. You'll see their eye shine and you'll get back to the car as quickly and as <laughs> safely as possible. Uh, we've had leopards kind of stalking us along the tops of ridges where you'll shine up and you'll see them and they'll kind of slink back and then you know they're up there. And so you keep an eye on them and it's, I'm talking all mellow right now, but at the time it's terrifying. Um, mm -hmm. And you definitely kind of, stop looking for lizards even though you're kind of still walking like acting like you're looking for lizards you're looking at the leopard making sure the leopard is not coming down um in oman oman's a very safe country and it's really really an amazing country to be the people are amazing the herps are amazing um no real danger there except for the i mean you can get you can get messed up by the animals there there's there's some venomous snakes there 
Um, but yeah, so, like Southern Africa is is pretty wild still. There's a lot of kind of dangerous situations you can get yourself into there with the animals. Uh, I'm trying to think if anything else. I mean, here in the USA, I've run into mountain lions, um, bears, but nothing where they were like attacking me or anything. I just saw them. And it's frightening when you're out there at night without a, a weapon and there's a mountain lion. Or, you know, I was in Texas looking for Texas alligator lizards and here comes a bear like, it's like oh shit and so yeah there's there's scary situations but keep your cool you know do what you've learned with these larger animals if you're near the car stay, stay by the car if you're not you know do what i i you know if a mountain lion is stalking towards you you want to grab stuff and raise it over your head and make yourself look big and yell at it the bears you want to make a lot of noise as you're hiking you're supposed to be making noise with the bears and usually when they see you they leave this bear didn't bother us but it was super close to us and i was actually going to make a video and i it was a whole trip of footage a whole trip of west texas i lost the, i lost the footage oh no oh yep. no whole trip oh i can't imagine yeah it's a bummer i'll i'll film something for a video here and i film for an hour and i at the end I don't have sound. I forgot to plug it in and I'll just be, oh my gosh, I just ruined. I can't no. imagine, Frank, I can't imagine a whole trip and losing something like that. I really can't. No. Yeah, I lost. Oh. Yeah, it was it was a three-day trip. It was a great trip. It had bears, it had good snakes, it had good lizards and stuff, and it's it's gone. I, I I'm over it, so it is what it is. But yeah, when I first realized <laughs> that I lost it, I was like, wait a minute, did I really lose that? Oh crap. Like, yeah, it's a bummer stomach sinks you just start thinking <clears throat> could i have done it over here could i have moved it and, and then you realize it's gone yeah i checked every memory card i have but Ouch. i mean at the same time it's it is what it is man i'll i'll make another one we have a question frank would you like to go to and i apologize i i feel uh ignorant here but Socotra. 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 So Socotra. Socotra is an island off the coast of Yemen, and it's basically between Yemen and Somalia. Um, this is where Hema Drake can come from. It's where Pristurs come from. It's where dragon trees. It's it's a really, really, really unique island. Um, and it's it's a it's Yemen. So it's it's a Yemen territory. And yes, Mickey, I would love to go to Socotra, and hopefully you will be there with me when we go. Um Right now, though, Socotra to me has gotten to kind of this Instagram fame and it's kind of it's burning it for me. It's it's very like hip with the Instagram wanderlust clown travelers right now um, because it was it was very off limits for a long time. I guess ISIS was there and it was a bunch Ooh. of sketchy stuff and you couldn't get a plane there. So people would have to take these boats out there. But it's an incredibly unique um very cool island there's the endemism there meaning the animals that are only found there and nowhere else is is one of the highest places in the world it's a lot like madagascar um and these geckos there there are there's a huge hemodrake in ribeki which is damn near a foot long just a beast of a gecko that lives there wow um and there's a bunch of pristurus there there's really unique all the the plant like the flora there is ridiculous it's like it's like a dr seuss book it's it's a wild country or a wild island i should say so um yes i would like to go there burned very much so it sounds like a unique place as far as just going there and studying and and comparing notes um you talk about the scorpion tails just comparing how do these differ from you know other locations yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of different Pristera species on Socotra that are um, that are really neat, really mm -hmm. neat. Uh, Hubs Reptile says, uh, ever come across rain frogs? Rain frogs. Yeah, I've come across a lot of rain frogs. I should have. Wally asked me for photos, and I actually did not um, send any pictures of rain frogs. Rain frogs are the the genus is Breviceps. And these are these, they're pretty popular a couple, maybe two months ago, these big, fat, little dopey looking frogs. Um, they basically live in the desert. Uh, I found them in the Kalahari Desert. I found Breviceps adspersus, which is one of the species that came in. There's two species that come in fairly often. There's adspersus and there's Mozambicus. And they're fat little, little job of the hut things. They're really, they're really neat frogs. I don't know how well they're going to do in captivity in the long run for people. I hope they do well, but I don't know if they're going to or not just because they're, they're pretty niche specific. 
there, I mean, a frog living in the Kalahari is, is a, that's a tough life to scratch out in the first place. And so we'd see them, um, it'd be, you know, totally dry. I'm there looking for tenopus, the barking geckos and conodactylus and, and colopus and different geckos. And then a thunderstorm would happen and it would rain. And these frogs would just literally appear out of the sand. Like they would just come out of the sand. And it was, I mean, it was really cool. I could email you these photos if you want to put wow. them up right now. I'd have to walk over to my computer though. Wow! But they're if, um, you, if you send them over, I'll certainly share on the page and see what I can do. Um, all right, let me here. I'll talk still. I'm going to be right here. Okay. Let me send them over, and I'll you can pop them up real quick. Um, let me do it real Folks, quick. we have a bunch of photos too that we're going to go through after these questions. Okay. I'm going to check the live here to see if anybody else has a question. Let me see. Angie has a couple of questions that we're going to get on real quick here. Did you start? Can you guys, can you hear me right now? Yes. Go ahead and ask them if you can hear me decently. Oh, okay. Okay. Let me get back up here just real quick. Um <laughs> what's the best thing you've spotted in South Africa? I mean, what is what? What do you like? <laughs> what is the best? <laughs> yeah. Let's talk for you. What was yeah, the best for you. Thing? For you, that's a great qu point, Nanette. What, for me, for it's, you? Uh, I mean, that's a, such a. I love all of it. Um, I mean, for me, I mean, I found a lot of. Uh, I guess it's Ouroboros cataphractus now, which is the armadillo lizards. Oh, which curl up in a ball, um, and so those are. Those are really impressive. And I mean, there's been some geckos that I found that were just, just insane. Like some Afroidura geckos that I really, really like. And um, I think one of my tops would be, I, I found an Angolan python in Namibia. And an Angolan python is a, is a, big, is a big one. They're extremely rare. And finding that was was pretty pretty amazing. Wow, wow! Just, I think I sent a picture of the Angolans. I just sent the pictures of those rain frogs. If you want to pop them up, okay. Um, I'm going to share this, and then I'm going to do some work behind the scenes here. Uh, Frank, can you recommend a restaurant in Al Sharkatat? Al Sharbatat. Thank you. Uh, I would not recommend eating in that town. That's a town in Oman. And yeah, we had like fish water with seven up and carrots. It was a terrible meal. Yum. It was actually really funny because this Italian couple showed up and I think they were lost and they just saw two other guys that obviously weren't Omani and they were like, oh, we'll have what they're having. And so they oh. ate the fish water and the carrots and they didn't even eat it. I think they just left. It was, it was pretty funny. <laughs> yes. Have you ever Somebody been else asked about a venomous snake bite and, yeah. um, I have not been bitten. Uh, a close friend of mine, Greg, who's in a lot of my videos, he's been, he got bit by a, um, a Crotalus lutosis, which is the Great Basin rattlesnake. Yeah, Angie Swartz. Um, so he got bit. Um, and he, it's funny, being a herper and being, you know, constantly looking and handling these animals, he got bit while fishing. So he didn't get bit while holding them. He didn't get bit while looking for them. He was fishing, climbing over some rocks, put his hand up got tagged um, oh my I think he spent the night in the hospital and you know big big swelling and stuff like that but other than that he was he was okay he got to the hospital pretty quick and he was fine oh my gosh what's the strangest or the most surprising thing you've ever found strangest or surprising thing I mean in terms of reptiles I don't know the reptiles are not really so yeah there's a rain frog um they're not I'm, I'm always very well aware of what's around, like where, where I am. And so I, I kind of know what we're going to run. That's when they come out. They're, they're all looking like that. Um, I'm always ve very well aware of kind of what's in the area. And so nothing really surprised me unless it's something really rare, like the big pythons. Um, those are surprising. Uh, one time, though, we were driving in the desert in Oman. And there was a, you know, you're always checking roadkill because it might be a lizard. And so there's a roadkill. So we pull up on it and it was a dead, it was a shark, a dead shark what? in the road. 
in the desert, Turk. probably 30 minutes or so from the ocean, there hmm. was a dead shark in the road. And so whether somebody threw it out of their car or whether a bird dropped it or something, I mean, it was a two foot shark just <laughs> dead in the road. So that was, wow. that was surprising. Um, and then, yeah, seeing the big, the big animals, I woke up in a tent in Namibia one morning and opened my tent and there was seven giraffe within <laughs> two feet of me all surrounding me. Like, Outstanding. Kind of down, like, whoa, what's this guy doing? Like, that was pretty wild. Um, and just, I mean, the culture shock, like Oman, for instance, um, my friend Mickey took me there for the first time. And I mean, just the culture shock. He had already been there many times. So he was just like perfect to be there with because he was like, everything's fine. And like, you know, let's just keep it. But it's just the culture shock is crazy in an in a Islamic country where, you know, coming from America, it's just so different. And it was so cool to just experience that. And to see how genuinely kind and amazing these people were, considering the crap that we hear, um, it was just, it was eye-opening for sure. And it was just really cool. It's really neat. Have you ever seen a turtle frog in Australia? I don't think I've seen a turtle frog in Australia. I, I actually haven't seen many frogs in Australia. When I was in Australia, I've only been to Western Australia, which is mostly the desert. And we saw... What was that? Something dynasties. Um, we saw a handful of frogs, but not a turtle frog. I don't even know what a turtle frog is, honestly. What's the Latin on that? Frank, what's the Latin on that? Frank the Tank. While Frank gets that available, what's the biggest spider you've seen? Massive spiders. Massive spiders. What like, is a massive spider size? Big spiders. Huge spiders. Wow. Like spiders that I don't like spiders in the first place, but spiders that I that don't want anything to do with. You know, what's really crazy, man, is I was in uh, I was in the Dominican Republic. Um, what was that last year, actually? And I was out. It was funny because so I was mixing business with pleasure. I was there. Uh, Myobactracus. Let me look that up real quick. I was in the Dominican Republic. Myobactracus. And, oh, man, those are so cool. And they're in Western Australia. I did not see those, but, geez, Louise, those are wild. There's actually a Mexican and an Indian frog that looks like those things. Those are a trip. I did not see those. They don't even look like it. They, those things look like they're aliens. Um, but, yeah, tarantulas, I was uh, – there was – I've never seen that many tarantulas. I was looking for a phylodactylus gecko. I was out in the jungle. I had my father-in-law with me because I was there for a wedding and I had my wife and my kids and they were like, I was like, you guys, you got a nice hotel to stay in. Me and the father-in-law, we're bouncing. We're going to the jungle. And I was wearing flip-flops and there was just these tarantulas everywhere. Like, I mean, it was crazy how many there were, uh, but I didn't get bit and they didn't crawl on me. So I was cool with it, but there was a lot of them. But I mean, there's so many scorpions and, and tarantulas and stuff like that. When you're looking for reptiles, you find that stuff because you're out at night and you're you're looking for this kind of stuff. Um, and so like big sulfugids, big scorpions, big tarantulas, all that stuff comes with the territory. So you kind of know going into places like this that I should be on the lookout. I should be aware. I should be, you know, kind of watching out for this, this, this and this. And then you kind of prepare your mind to to. Or, or none of those at, at all, you know, and then you're more comfortable turning over rocks or, or well, I mean, I, when I show up, I don't know. I have no idea what kind of bugs are going to be there. Cause I just okay. don't know. I don't look into bugs. I just yeah. know, I know that there's obviously going to be bugs. So when I'm flipping something, chances are, yeah, there might be a freaking giant scalopendra, giant centipede under there. I've had one of those things fall on my back out oh. of a tree in Puerto Rico is terrible. Um, but yeah, there's bugs. There's always big bugs. And so you just got to be ready for that. That's part of the game. Angie says that's the only thing that would keep her from traveling. Um, <laughs> I've got a bunch of photos here. We've got to go through these photos. Thank you very much for sharing these. So, so folks, we're learning about Frank here. We're learning about the the, I guess you know the education part, the research, the sharing information. Uh, you you know who the real Frank is though. That's the real Frank. So, so in this battle, who won? 
This was actually, um, it was funny, man. It was, it was not a, you, normally this is a battle. Normally this is a big battle. This is Varanus um, albigularis. This is the white throat monitor and, or it's the black. I don't, I don't actually remember white or black throat. One of them, somebody will know here, but so these guys are usually just brutal and they want to brawl. This is in central Namibia. Um, we pulled up on this guy. Dude, he was laying in the road, just soaking up the heat. And we just walked right up to him and picked him up. He didn't run. He didn't do anything. Wow. Um, he wasn't injured. That down there by his legs. When you catch a big male like that, they'll avert their hemipenes right off the bat. Those are his sexual organs down there, basically just showing like, yo, you want some of this? Like, don't mess with me. <laughs> um, and he was just sitting there like, he was actually very mellow. I've caught in big rock monitors that are nasty. And he was chill. But it was just, it made a good, uh, it made a good, made for a good photo. And that was me in my younger years. I think I was, I don't know, 20, um, probably 30, 26. I don't know. Did you say 10? Yeah. 10. Come on now. Look, I got a five o'clock shadow going at least. <laughs> I, I can imagine taking all of these. And I, I tell you, you take great photos. So above and beyond all of this other, when you, when you share on your videos, you know, here we are looking around and we're going to look for and, oh, we found it. And then you share photos of these animals, Frank, and they're just exquisite. They're just perfect photos. So congrats for your photography skills above and beyond everything else. Thanks. Sometimes it's, I mean, a lot of times it's me. Sometimes it's my buddy who saw him. Sometimes it's other people. But yeah, I, I try my best. So this is an Ekis. This is an Oman. Um, this, this guy will put you down for sure. It was just an interesting situation because these guys are usually strictly terrestrial and this little guy was just up in this bush. You obviously know ahead of time, are these aggressive? Are they docile? Can I can I kind of get closer to them? Should I just back the heck out, off of these guys? Yeah, I mean I do, but then at the same time it's it's a per it's a it's an it's like a per snake basis, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Come up to one Everyone's of these. Different. Sometimes they're mellow. Sometimes they're had a bad day and they're psycho. So this one was chill. A lot of times at night, if you're not messing with them, they're pretty mellow. I mean, they're just going to do their thing. And I've got a big diffuser on my flash. I'm sorry. It kind of that. blocks me from getting tagged if I'm really close to them. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I mean, I'm not, I'm not within <laughs> tagging distance at this point. I don't think from the snake. And this is not a big snake. These are. I don't know, 24 inches max. <clears throat> Proximity to hospitals. Um, <laughs> no, actually. I mean, yes, you should. No, I don't. Um, I'm absolutely not planning on getting bit. I'm definitely not like super careful though. I wear flip-flops a lot. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm not the type to be out there in like these big hiking boots and just this stupid, you know, safari yeah. hat and all this crazy gear. Like, I, I don't like that. I'm out there literally in my shorts and my flip flops and a t shirt. I mean, wow. if I'm in tall grass or whatever, I'm going to wear shoes and pants. But generally speaking, like in this photo, man, it's hot. It's 100 degrees. Yeah. I'm not trying to wear more clothes than I need to. In terms of hospitals, like a lot of these countries, you're a little ways from a hospital. But when you do get there, they've got the anti venom and everything's free. So it's not going to be like you're going to show up and they're going to be like, well, let's see your insurance card and let's do this <laughs> and let's do that. It's like, no, he's bit. Get him in. Let's fix him up. Get him in. Let's go. Yeah. My buddy Mickey, who I traveled to Oman with a lot, uh, we had, I don't know if his if my wife was there on that trip, but his wife, Benny, was there. And we were we, we had gone snorkeling and she stepped on a pretty gnarly piece of glass, I think, and sliced Ooh. her open really good. Ooh. We went to the hospital. They stitched her up. I think it cost $5 or something. They totally fixed it. Might it might have been free? I can't remember, but it was super cheap, and it was they were very nice. And it was, it's it's generally very different from what you would experience here in the states. You mentioned the flip flops, okay. and I do remember watching one of your earlier videos and seeing you in flip flops and thinking exactly that. Um, why wouldn't you wear something you know a little bit higher top just to to protect yourself just in case? But you know, again, you're very comfortable. You've done this. You're experienced. And I mean, it's, I, I don't think it's smart to do what I'm doing. I don't recommend doing it. I'm just, I'm in like, to me, at least I'm in my element. I am chilling. I'm happy and I want to be free and comfortable and it's hot and dude, I'm hanging out. 
I'm with my buddies. I'm looking at my buddies, my snake, the snakes are my buddies. I'm chilling. I'm not getting, I'm not doing stupid things to get bit. If I get bit, it's going to be a terrible accident, but I'm not asking for problems. Yeah. You don't see me free handling these snakes. You don't see me messing with them on video. Um, I'm, I'm taking photos. I'm documenting. I'm out of here. Frank, would you encourage people to write down and publish observations like you do in the field? Yeah. So if you do go reptile, reptile hunting and you see something that you think is, is unique, write it down. Like get like publishing stuff is great. It's awesome. You get basically immortalized um, and you can publish stuff. You don't need to be a scientist to publish stuff. Like me and my buddies, we've published lots of papers in journals and in scientific journals and um, and it's doable. And so that kind of stuff should be done and it should be kind of a goal even for you to do. Like when you're out there, observe and, and take notes. This is, how, this is how all this knowledge came to be is, is old scientists back in the 1700s being like, that's weird that that snake is eating that mouse without chewing. I should write that down. And they'd write it down. And then more of them would write that down. And they'd be like, you know what? This must be how these animals eat. And like, so that furthers the knowledge of, of herpetology. And that can also kind of help you separate yourself a little bit from the masses of the people that you see at the reptile shows. Like, yo, I'm a, I'm published, you know, I'm not a herpetologist, but I've, I've contributed. My name is now cemented in herpetology forever because I have, you know, I've, I've written an article. So it's a really cool thing to do. And now every time somebody Googles, you know, Echis carinatus or something like that, your name is going to maybe pop up as a, as a, you know, a short note in one of these journals. And that's another fun thing to do when you're when you're down in these places and you see something unique is you write it down, you take a photograph, you write up a little paper and submit it to a journal. Um, in my little world, in my little mind, I started doing the YouTube videos for that reason, not to become famous or anything, but just to document and and to be able to go back two, three, four, five years and say, this is how I kept animals back then, or or maybe something that I could share with other people and say, you know, this is how I'm doing it. Just compare these notes, and it just as a you know, kind of an educational thing. I've got I've got to ask this from Angie. Do you ever handle any of the different species? And I think you mentioned that a little bit, but I, I'd like to I'd like to know this too because I would you know if I'm if I'm finding a strophurus or something like that, you know, I know it's terrible. But it would be hard on my first trip not to pick it up and hold it and let it walk in my hand. Why wouldn't you? I would. I do. Absolutely. Well, you know, there's a thing about keeping nature as nature and not disturbing. Nonsense. And... That's absolute nonsense. <laughs> there's, there, so there's, yes, there, there's truth to what you said. Um, and there's laws. <laughs> Actually, yeah. some, some countries you can't hold animals, but... I tend to do it anyways. Um, but I, I, I hold an animal very gently. I feel like I'm, I'm very versed in knowing the stress levels of animals, knowing when is enough, knowing if I should or if I shouldn't. But finding your first strophorus and letting it crawl onto your finger and, and taking a picture and looking at that animal and, and having a moment with that animal and then letting it go, nothing wrong with that. I don't care who says what. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, and same goes for other animals. Uh, in terms of venomous snakes, if you know what you're doing, go ahead, tangle with them a little bit. Uh, free handling, not a good look. But, you know, do your thing. Just understand what you're dealing with. I don't think that you should try to influence other people to do things like that. Um, but I'm also I'm also like, I don't know, man. I, it, it, like, I'm, I'm kind of not. I'm not into like, if you can't think for yourself and if you're, if you're stupid enough to go out and just be like, Hey, this guy held this venomous snake with nothing. I'm going to do it too. And you get bit. Yo, that's your problem, man. You can't save everybody. It's like a little Darwinism there. Like you, you figure it out. If you can't, then get bit. Like, that's just the way it goes. Like you can't, you can't help everybody. You know what I mean? hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. What's going on here? What is this? Uh, this is my buddy Greg on the left and then Mike on the right. And then this is a sidewinder. So this is in the deserts of Southern California. So this is kind of my, my backyard per se. And uh, it was just, it was, it, it, it was kind of looking at them in this cool pose. So I just got behind it with a wide angle lens and just took some shots and it turned out pretty cool. 
so so I'm going to add to this that I mean you are you're so knowledgeable you kind of know what to expect from this snake you you've been there you've done that and not yeah. to say that every animal isn't different but you know what to look for in creating this this uh, wonderful photography here. Yeah, I mean, well, it just it looked good, and I wasn't necessarily going to be like, oh, it's going to look good with like the horizon going diagonal across the screen and blah blah blah. But yeah, it ended up just being this was the way that it worked out, and I don't think it's a perfect photo by any stretch of the imagination, but it's I think it's cool. It's a different perspective. Um, I mean, like I said, I, I don't I don't think it's like an amazing photo. You can't see the snake's face, but it, it's a good lifestyle photo. Like this, these two dudes are looking at this venomous snake that's protecting itself, and it's just a good situation. Like I like, they've got a nice distance between themselves and the snake. Uh, Greg has a safe handling tool in his hand. Everybody's keeping a distance, except for me, <laughs> and it I, it worked out. More of uh, photos and videos just like this on Reptilian Diaries, folks. Go out there and subscribe. Got to ask what this is. I, I know geckos. I don't know what this is. So this is a basilisk. Um, and this is kind oh, of the, oh. this is the unknown, not unknown, it's known, but this is the, so you've got, you've got basilisk, basilisk, basilicus vitatus, and you've got basilicus, basilicus, and then you've got basilicus plumiforms. Those three are more or less in the hobby occasionally. And then you've got Basilicus galleritus, which is this. And these guys are really not in the hobby. Um, these are from Ecuador and Colombia, and they're just a very unique species of basilisk. So these, for the people who don't know, this is like the Jesus Christ lizard. These are the ones who can run bipedally across water. How big is this animal? It's 24 inches. It's a good sized lizard. No, I thought it was bigger than that. <clears throat> mm. This is a, a very rare alligator lizard. This is Elgaria wow. panamatina. So this is the panamint alligator lizard. And these guys are only found in these tiny little springs in the middle of the super gnarly, rugged, high altitude desert in uh, kind of the eastern Sierras of central California. And me and my buddy who saw them went out to try to look for these things, not really having thinking we were going to have much luck. And we ended up finding, I think, four of them in like, 30 minutes and then didn't find a single one for the next day and a half so that's that's how it works sometimes you, uh you mentioned high altitude <laughs> desert i'm sure that that's an environment that has very stringent kind of requirements yeah it's just it's very harsh it's got a short summer and a long winter and um and then their micro habitat is these streams and these springs which are even yeah they're they're on their way out i'm sure a uh, couple thousand years, they won't be here anymore. Uh, I, I'm going way off on a tangent here, but I'm trying to think of his last name. Nathan is in California too, Reptile Keeper. I thought he was breeding these at one time, and maybe you can't keep these. Maybe I'm thinking of something completely Probably different. Probably a different species. It could have been Multicarinata, or it could have been um, Shastensis, or it could have, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of different species. Th these ones are actually, I don't know if these are federally, federally protected, but these are state protected. Okay. Um, so I, I, people might be keeping them, but I don't, I don't think it would be a public situation if somebody was keeping these. <clears throat> Beautiful. Ah, another great photo. This is a mole snake. Uh, this is in the edge of the Kalahari desert and this is Sudaspis canna. And this is the black version. This is almost like an, a, this is kind of like an indigo snake, an American indigo snake. These things are solid muscle, just solid muscle. They're thick. They're I mean, they just brutalize their prey. They don't even necessarily wrap it up. They just grab it and go. They're savages. These are such gnarly snakes. Like this snake's like four feet long and it was such oh. a, just a, and that's not even a big snake, but I mean, this thing was a hand full because they're just so muscly. They're just, they're gnarly snakes. So one of my common, favorites. Rare to see. Hard, hard uh, to they're find. fairly common, but the black ones are, are pretty rare. So we were super stoked to see a black one. Um, these actually used to come into the pet trade a long time ago. Linda Switzer had some, uh, she had more of the garden phase from, from North up in Kenya and Tanzania, but these black ones are generally only found in, in Southern Africa and kind of the Kalahari down to Cape town is where you find these black ones. And they're just, they're stunning snakes. Very cool. What a wonderful lady too, Linda. Yeah. <clears throat> this is just a, this is a Koki frog. These are all over. These are in Hawaii now. 
<clears throat> I think they're in Florida too. This is in Puerto Rico. It just was a cool racing stripe on this one. They didn't all have these stripes and they make a, a very kind of a, oh. <laughs> and a lot of people, they drive them nuts because they're actually really kind of taken over in Hawaii. But in Puerto Rico, if you've ever been there, you've most likely heard the Koki frogs. Neat. Predominant frog in the area in Puerto oh, Rico. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. How, how big? Two inches, maybe max. Okay. And then smaller. It, are they in the hobby? Uh, I think they are. I mean, I would assume they are. The freaking things are everywhere. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, yes, there's a few people who have them. Okay. Very cool. This is a leopard tortoise, old boy. Um, we we're in Southern Africa and we we're driving down a dirt road and this guy was just moseying along. So we hopped out and said hello, took his photo and moved on. But yeah, these guys are real popular in the in the pet trade. Very cool. This is a Sacus caudivulvus. Um, no, this is is it? No, it's not caudi. This is a Sacus platyrhynchus, and these are in Oman. This is a pretty common gecko in northern Oman. Um, big fan toed gecko, obviously colorful, really nice, really nice animals. Uh, there's one or two people who keep these in the U.S., maybe some in Europe, but they're not not real common. So regular fantails are, you know, the more common fantails. They're three, three and a half, four inches. How big is this guy? This is this, this is a little smaller, um, but a really lanky compared to big fanto. Like fantoids are teodactylus, and they're they're more beefy. These guys are a lot more gracile, as you can tell. They're just they're very. You know they're they're dainty little geckos. They're good size, but they're just they're gaunt. They're bony, stringy little things. Solid rock dwelling gecko. Cliffs, big big boulders, rock walls. Mm -hmm. This is everybody's favorite. Mm -hmm. um, this is never Nephris levis pilbarensis. I think it's either pilbarensis or occidentalis. I think it's pilbarensis. Um, these guys are in Western Australia, super common in the pet trade, really neat geckos. I mean, obviously look at it. It looks like a little puppy dog or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we found a handful of these guys out there and it was amazing. It's cool to see them. I mean, being able to see these in the wild should, you know, tempt anybody to go to Western Australia. How hard are the, the knob tails to find in the wild? Do you have to do something different? Do you have to look for certain... Is there certain times of the day that you're looking for them? So the majority of geckos you're going to be looking at night, um, all night, basically, is kind of how that rolls. You go late. I mean, you go, it depends on where you are. Australia usually shut down. I think we'd be in and asleep by two or three in the morning. Oman, a lot of times you'll be, you'll be, you'll be seeing the sun start to rise before you go to sleep. But uh, these guys, they're out at night and they're kind of in the, the, kind of the edges of the sandy dunes. They do like to have some bushes and grassy stuff like that to burrow underneath. But they're, um, so you'll find like dune, like real actual dunes and you'll find like uh, Lucasium stenodactylum and some different diplodactylus and, and strophorus and stuff. Or you won't find strophorus in the dunes, but you'll find a couple diplos in the dunes and then you'll move over to where there's actually bushes and stuff. And that's where you'll find strophorus in the bushes. And then these guys, We'll kind of be cruising around on the bases at the base of the bushes and near the, you know, near the the entrance to their little burrows and stuff. And because they need kind of they need sand that's going to hold a burrow because that's where they they burrow down into the the root structures of these plants at, in the daytime. Wow. Uh, just you know something so small that little note that you made and, and I was. Before you went and talked about their burrows in plant roots, I was going to ask, but boy, you just answered it before I could even ask. But I'm gonna, I'm hoping that you will kind of refer to a different situation. But let me phrase this, let me frame it up. In the hobby, and, and this goes all the way back to the beginning of the the uh, talk here, beginning of the live. I mentioned we're keeping animals in boxes, and we're keeping you know animals our certain way because we've learned from our peers, we've learned from different people, we've learned from books, we've learned from the internet, haven't learned anything from Facebook, but we've learned from the internet, and we're keeping something like this, another, get. let's say geckos, let's focus on geckos, but you've been in the wild, and you've seen these animals, 
Give me one thing, Frank, that you would look at the way that Wally or Joe Hupp or somebody else keeps a gecko and say, we are keeping this animal wrong. As an example, you just said plant roots. So we in the hobby keep these boxes with dirt and a couple of hides above the sand and they burrow in and everything. But man, wouldn't it be cool to have plants in our uh, knob tail enclosure so that they could burrow into the roots? Give me another example kind of like that. Well, I mean, yeah, sure. It would be awesome to have plants in your cages. And it, it is awesome to have plants in your cages. It's just that most people that keep that get to the point of keeping nephros, it's there's like a progression. It's like they start with something basic. They start with leopard geckos. They start with crested geckos. And then by the time they get to, to nephros, they have a big collection usually where they don't have room to put plants in their cages because they want to have tons of reptiles. And so they keep rack systems where they keep geckos in the rack systems. And so most people who keep knobtails, they know that knobtails like a humid, warm hide. That humid, warm hide is the root ball. I mean, you're, you're making it. You're, they don't care about the roots. Yeah. They, they want the, the humid soil that's going to hold a burrow and keep the temperature down and that that's what the roots provide and if you're able to provide that in a different way then i think the lizard is fine with that um wanting to provide that aesthetically is is awesome and being able to have a you know i mean you, dude to, to make to make that work in a terrarium you'd need to have a you know a, a foot or two feet of soil sand and a big you know a big plant that has been established in this situation. And then chances are, man, you're going to put the damn gecko in there and he's going to dig in the corner and not even in the plant. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's tough to do. It would be rad in a perfect world, but I think the reason why like we're at where we're at is because people have tried and then they've gotten to the point where they're like, well, if I put a plastic hide and fill it with damp sand, that plastic is going to hold the moisture in, that sand is going to stay damp, it's going to stay warm, and the lizard can burrow into it, and that creates the root ball, and everything's everything's perfect. So that, I think that kind of should answer the question, and, and that's a lot of geckos, a lot of terrestrial geckos that live in the deserts, that's where they live. I mean, there's no other place to live. They have to burrow, they have to get out of the heat, and to get out of the heat, they need to get a few inches underneath the soil underneath the surface makes 100 percent sense because that's exactly what would happen uh design uh research design set up and then they use this other place in the in the uh, enclosure to uh call home yep i i think i know what this is and knowing geckos this is a, a new zealand nope <laughs> i was gonna say i bet you don't this is a tough one I didn't know. I honestly didn't know this one until I went there. This is Australia. This is Strophorus. Are you? Oh my God. Um, this is Strophorus Michelsoni. This is a I very rare Spinifex dwelling Strophorus from Western Australia. So wow. this is a, um, this is a rare one. Like I said, I, I really didn't know anything about this gecko until I went there. It was one of, I saw it and I was like, dude, I really want to see those. And uh, I mean, we nailed the microhabitat and we found them, which is not an easy feat. Like you really, this is, this is another, it's a, it's a microhabitat specific gecko. And so that means you don't just show up and go, Hey, we're here at night. There they are. They're everywhere. That's, that's not how it works at all. You, you go there and you've got to dial down where they're at. There's a huge space and there's a very small niche that this gecko fills and you find that niche in the day. You say there's all of this scrubby bush and stuff like that, but these things live in spinifex. Where's the spinifex? You find the spinifex bushes finally in the daytime in the 105 degree heat. You pin them on your phone. And then at night you come back. There's that spinifex bush. Let's go look. Boom. There they are. And then that's it. You look in the other bushes. You can look in a million of the other bushes. They're not there. Look in the spinifex bush. There they are. The photo, I took them out of the spinifex bushes because spinifex is one of the most terrible plants in the world. But so I put them on this branch instead because spinifex is just a, it's a pure nightmare. So, many so people they're staying, that. they're staying in the spinifex because that's their protection, right? Spin, yeah. Spinifex is basically like giant 
cactus spikes just thrown into a big giant ball. It's terrible stuff. And so when they're in the spin effects, they'll be sitting up on the top. And then as soon as you come, they go down into it and you cannot get in there because it's, it's no joke. It's like terrible spines, dude. And they make you itchy and it's just terrible stuff. Um, people have multiple people have asked me like, Hey, wouldn't, wouldn't it be awesome to have spin effects in a cage? And I'm just like, dude, get rid of that thought immediately. No, you might as well keep poison Oak in a cage. Like it's terrible, dude. Don't do it. Don't do it. So, so, so somebody that doesn't know animals, doesn't know reptiles, doesn't know geckos, doesn't know strophurus, they're going to look at a picture like this and go, eh, it's a gray gecko with some nice white lines. And the people that do know reptiles, geckos, you know, strophurus, oh my God. Yeah. This is amazing. Yeah. And that's kind of what you want to do when you're taking photos is you want to be like, I want to please the gecko people, but then I also want it to, I want to please anybody. I want them to look at that and go, dude, that's a, that is awesome, dude. Like, wow. And this is actually one of my favorite photos. I just, I really like it. I like the pose. The eye is there. The, it's, it's just a good one. I like this one. I, I, again, I am amazed. Um, what a, what a wonderful animal. Yeah. He looks Let's amazing. talk about this guy. Crabby. Like me. Yeah, these, people love crabby. these. This is, this is Tenopus. Um, Tenopus garlus maculatus. This is the barking gecko. And a lot of people, I don't think they know how to say it, but it's Tenopus. It starts with a P, but the P is silent. It's P-T-E-N-O-P-U-S. So a lot of people say Petenopus, but it is Tenopus. And this is, yeah, barking gecko. These guys are in uh, Namibia and South Africa and Botswana. And they're like crickets, literally. They're so loud at night. It's in, it's amazing, like deafening. But they're really beautiful. They live in big colonies. The males get um, the big kind of yellow orange throat, and they look like little gobies. And they're just they're just neat little geckos. And um, people love these. There's there's a small amount in the hobby. There, there's a handful of species, and um, yeah, people are doing pretty good with them. They're neat. This is actually one of my like hands down favorite geckos i'm, I'm kind of i'm not over them but i've they've lost the allure but i mean this is what like my whole life is all like even a lot of my old screen names were like it was tenopus like this was my jam boy just i just came up with about 10 questions but i'll kind of narrow it down here number one <laughs> Number one, you, you said that they're in the hobby, but not many people are keeping them successfully. I know Joe Hupp is doing a great job. I don't think there's that many people that are really, really working with these. So, handful. Yeah. What? Joe's, got, Joe's got Koki and yeah. maybe Carpy, but I don't think he does. I think he has Koki. And Koki Koki's actually the, probably the one that's doing best in captivity. Um, Roger Rocks did really well with him over in Europe. Um yeah, Joe's done well with them. My buddy Hussam has done well with them. Uh, maybe a handful of other people have done pretty well with them over the years. Um, and then Tenopus Carpi, they were bred pretty well in captivity for a while, but they've more or less disappeared. There's just very few people who have them anymore. And then Maculatus, there's a couple people who have them. Um, Chris C, I don't know how to say his last name, but it's like mine, Ciceroni or Cerocioni, or it's a gnarly bunch of C's. It's like my, it's literally like my last name. Sorry, Chris, but you know, you know how it is. We grew up, nobody's saying our last names correctly. Um, he's got these and there's some other guys. There's a few people breeding them. I've bred these in the past. Um, I've actually bred all of them except for Garlus Garlus, which is a smaller species. And those guys are also in captivity. And yeah, so people are breeding all of them, but yeah, they're far and few between. It's a it's a collector's gecko. It's this is for the rare the rare gecko guys. Is there? And I don't want to dwell on this, but I am a gecko guy. Is there a um, secret? Is there you know a make sure that you do this if you're going to to number one keep them and, and number two breed them? Not really. I mean, what really? kind of like I would start like if you're gonna if you're gonna get tenopus, I'd start with koki because they they seem to do the best, and I don't want to say they're the easiest because those guys are putting a lot of work into them, but they do seem to just be the easiest. They just do the best. Um, with maculatus and garlus garlus, there's there's you need to kind of get animals from the same locale, which can be difficult because they're far and few between. 
because they form big colonies and they're not really sure how these colonies work, whether they're intermingling or whether each colony is kind of like specific to itself and won't breed, won't breed with another colony. Um, so it's, hmm. it's, it, it's tough, but yeah, you need to, you need to get animals kind of at the same time. You can't be getting like this orange animal and then a, a more green animal from somebody in Europe. Cause chances are they're not going to breed. They might, but it's going to be tough. You're going to have better success if you, if you have animals. From the same business. Again, that's a fact that probably hardly anybody knows about or, or considers. Um, let me ask this. So you, you happen upon these guys, how much time, and I know it's, more than most people would would spend but how much time do you just sit there observing these guys you know in their behavior in these groups and the males interacting and, and the males interacting with females and how, we'll see, you i mean you'll, we'll sit and watch them um but they're hard to observe because they live underground and they they sit at the at, they sit at the very entrance of their burrows and they bark they sit there and, da, 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 and they call and each species has a different call so these guys are more like da, da, they're pretty loud. And then the smaller garlis garlis, they're more like da, 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 da. and then the koki are even faster. They're more like da, 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 da. and then the carpi are even, I think no, they're real slow and quiet. They're more pop, pop, pop. So you'll hear them, and then uh, you'll go and we use eye shining technique to where you kind of you pick up the glare on their eyes and you go and find them. And usually by the time you start walking over, they drip, they're gone. And so you can either dig them up if you want to get a photograph which a lot of people freak out and cry that i dig them up but i don't care i dig them up and then i let them go and um get the photo let them go or yeah you can just you can sit there and watch them but literally all you're going to do unless you stay out there all night long they're just they poke their little head up they just sit there and then another one pokes its head out and there's some areas man where i told you earlier that it's deafening they're like crickets they're they're so loud just da, 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 like thousands of them they form huge colonies and there'll be thousands of them barking, especially in the Kalahari where it's, it's unbelievable. It's unreal. Frank <laughs> saying that you're with your calls, you're, you're making his morning geckos uh, upset. I've been keeping geckos too long, man. I sound like them now, even. Huh? So for my YouTube, my YouTube channel, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a very serious question uh, that I've asked previous and I'm going to put that in the short and then I'm going to take your calls and I'll just put that <laughs> right answer. behind my serious <laughs> question. So it makes us all perfect. Um, I have more pictures. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think this is the last one we haven't seen. Is there even parthenogenic yeah, yeah. populations? There is. Um, there is. There is a parthenogenic population in Namibia. Um, I I personally don't know where it is, but there is. I don't know if anybody has them anymore. For a while, there was some people in Europe that had them, but I'm not sure how well they did. Honestly, I don't. I don't know that much about them, but I know that a guy was producing. A, he produced a couple of them, but I'm not sure that they stuck around very long. Um, I don't know if it was a actual parthenogenic population or if it was one of these things where a dude had a female for so long where she was just like, "Man, I better reproduce, or I'm just going to be the end of my species." So, I don't know what happened there, but yes, Baron, that is true. I, I think that there's so much that we don't know in the hobby. You know, I, I don't think that it was common uh, knowledge that uh, even crested geckos, yeah, uh, at times are parthenogenic. Exactly. So, um, Wally, I got about I got about 15 more minutes, and then I got to get no. Out of here. I'm I just I looked and I thought we were at the top of the hour, but like an hour ago, this oh, okay. time has flown yeah, by. So I don't want to. No. no, I don't want to keep you here, Frank. I I more than cherish this time. Yeah. And, uh, Let's just go ahead and ask this last question. I'm going to see if I have any other final questions, but have you ever went to view uh, Komodo dragons? I mean, honestly, man, um, if I went to Komodo, I'd be looking for like the Cernodactylus and the Damascus that live on that island more than I'd be looking for the Komodo dragons. And it's the same with the Galapagos. It's like people are like, oh, do you want to go to the Galapagos Islands? I'm like, I do for the Philodactylus geckos, not for the tortoises. So <clears throat> I'm about the obscure stuff. That's my whole thing is like I keep the rare and the weird stuff. And that's like why when I travel, that's what I'm looking for mostly. So would I go to Komodo? Yes. And I would obviously I'd see the I think I would see the Komodo dragons without trying. But I would be more interested in seeing 
the different geckos that are on that island and uh, uh you know there's there's um whatever that trim uh trimaris insularis um there's some cool there's some vipers there there's some neat um some other lizards there so i mean yeah i'd be there and i'd see the komodos but am i gonna like save up and dump a bunch of money on that trip probably not um if i was down in bali or in like you know indonesia looking specifically for something else and it popped up where i was like hey we have a boat we're going to komodo you want to come i'd do it but i don't know if i would um if i would target that to me that's like it's just there's there's some it's like more of it's like a tourist trap i hate to say that but it is and so is galapagos it's just it's gotten to be too much like i was in ecuador i could have went and i was just i wanted to be more in the choco rainforest to see these other really rare snakes and rare lizards um rather than and 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 i'm also then surrounded by people who are interested in reptiles more than like oh i'm on a boat going out to the galapagos with just a bunch of you know tom dick and larry's to just go out and and him and haw at the marine iguanas and the, and the galapagos tortoises I, I don't want to say that i'm like better than them i'm not by any stretch of the imagination no. but i'm just i'm more acutely interested in like you know i would i would actually rather go see the aldabra giant tortoises because nobody goes and sees those I, I would rather see that. I'd rather post photos of that to like document that than document something that, you know, 7,000 people a year document. I can completely understand that. There's so much more to do to see. Um, why not do that? Yeah. Frank, I have one more question and then, then I'm going to let you go. This has been more than generous of you to spend this time. Yeah, we, with can, us. we can always do a, a part two. Absolutely. And maybe, you know, do a deep dive on. Maybe a, a, a yeah one specific trip and and talk yeah. about you know some of the adventures that you you had on the trip what your expectations were what you what you discovered um, I'm going to leave everybody with this what's next uh, and I ask that because watching uh, reptilian diaries again it just I get the sense that eventually in five years ten years the kids are growing up up a little bit. I can see you doing guiding services to this place or that place or that place. Where do you want to go? How many people? Let's go. Yeah. What's next for you? We thought about, I mean, me and my friend Mickey have talked about that in Oman. He's actually, I think, done it. We were going to do it, but a bunch of people kind of backed out. And I don't know. I mean, in ter- so like, with, let, let me explain Reptilian Diaries real quick. So I don't, like I, and I'm not, like, I don't care about having a YouTube presence at all. Like, I, I don't. I don't have time. I don't have the energy. I don't have... Um, I, I just don't have what... I don't know. I, I don't care about it. Like, I don't... Like, for people who are doing it, like, big time, I it's rad. I appreciate what they're doing. Like, even, like, your stuff, I appreciate what you're doing. I just, for me, what I want with my channel, I, I want to do... My channel, I want it to be trips. That's what I want it to be. I don't want to... I think I will show people my collection maybe like once every couple of years, but I don't want to like just walk through my collection and I don't like, there's enough people doing that and they're doing a good job of it. I don't need to, I don't need to show that. I want to do trips. And for me in my life right now, trips don't happen every week. Trips don't happen every month. And I, so I can't have a schedule where it's like every Saturday I'm going to upload or every this I'm going to like that. I tried, it doesn't work. It's, it's too much for me and it stresses me out and it, it doesn't work. So for me, I just want to make a body of work that's going to be, it's going to come out when it comes out. I don't care how many subscribers I have. I don't care if people like it or not. It's for my kids and it's for me to look back on. And if you guys like it, then that's awesome. And when I put videos out, those videos will stay there and they'll stay on YouTube and they'll be there for anybody to watch. And I'll, and I always answer comments and I answer questions. And when people hit me up, I'm nice to them about it, but I just, yeah, I'm not the, I'm not the YouTube guy who's going to, who's going to go after the algorithms and, and try to do that. I mean, I'll do the whole, you know, I'll make the the, the thumbnail and I'll write the description. So hopefully it, it gets views and whatever. But I mean, I'm just more at the point where it's like, people are like, dude, you haven't put out a video for years. Is it dead? It's like, it's not dead. I just haven't traveled. Bro. I have kids. I have young kids. I, I can't travel right now, but I'm going on a trip. My buddy Mike invited me down to uh, go to Mexico in a, in a couple of weeks. And I'm going to do just, it's a quick little trip. And 
I'm going to go down there and we're going to see some really cool lizards that I don't think have been filmed very often. And it's just going to be awesome. And I'm going to make a nice video. And so I'll have a new series, two or three videos in the next month or two. So people should be stoked on that. Like I said earlier, I was going to make another West Texas video, but I lost all the footage. So that happens. Um, and then I'm going to Mexico again later this year with my family, but I will definitely get out in the jungle and find some animals. So I'll probably do another quick video. So there will be videos, um, but it's not going to be any sort of schedule and it's not going to be any sort of like, you know, trying to wow people into subscribing. It's just going to be what I do. Um, in terms of the future for me is just going to be doing reptiles, collecting my books um, and just being stoked on reptiles, still traveling, raising my kids, keeping them outside, keeping them happy um, and just being a, you know, being a good dude, not getting into all the nonsense and drama within this hobby right now and, and just trying to be cool, man. I, I felt like I was ready to give you some advice on YouTube uh, as far as do the things that you love and, and don't do anything more. Um, yeah. But man, you're such a level-headed guy. It's, it's really an honor to know you and, and, and talk to you, especially tonight. Um, keep doing what you're doing. And, and I'm going to be the biggest advocate for you to do more videos because I'm, I'm a very selfish person and I want to see yeah. what you're pushing out there on YouTube. I want to see these animals because it blows my flipping mind. I'll get comments all the time. Oh, you should have more viewers and subscribers. It blo I, whatever, you know, I'm an old guy talking about geckos. It does blow my mind that you don't have a bazillion subscribers because this is what everybody keeping reptiles should be watching. They should be watching what's going on in the wild and looking at landscapes and looking at, don't look at the animals just yet. Don't look at the animals just yet. Look at how they're acting in the wild. And that's what blows my mind, Frank, is that you don't, you don't have a million subscribers. It really does. And it's, it makes me sad. Well, I don't, I don't be sad, man. That would stress me out. I don't think I need that. I've got, uh, I've got enough on my plate right now. And yeah, a million subscribers is just too much. That, I mean, a couple thousand is fine. Like, it's just too many people that I feel like, yo, I need, it stresses me out, dude. I, I want to, I like making these videos and I started making these videos literally for myself and my daughters just to like, to make them and to see, like, show my buddies what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And it, it was fun for me. And then COVID happened and it was, and then I had all this Australian footage and then it was really fun. Cause I was like, dude, this yeah. is awesome. I got all this footage. I can make these videos. I don't have to go to work every day. I'm home. But now that that's kind of all changed and we had the second baby and, and shit just got crazy. Um, and you know, right now I just, I don't have time to, to do it. So, but I'm going to make time for this next one. And, and the lizards that we're going to see are going to be awesome. You'll be stoked on it. I know you will. They're always and, awesome. So well, I appreciate it. And, um, but yeah, man, that being said, it's been awesome, but I got a jam and I appreciate you guys having me on here. I'm down to do a, tar a part two um, whenever you guys hit me up. And yeah, Absolutely. Dude. It would be, again, it would be our pleasure and, and honor. Angie Angie said before, yeah, this is the best Thank you, Angie. stream that ever. I, I, I say that with every, every guest, but this is, I told cool. you before, you know, I wrote up this whole big script and then I threw it away and I completely <laughs> redid it and and uh, didn't get to half of my questions, so there is going to be a part two for yeah, us. We'll do Absolutely, it. I'm cool. With Thank it. you very much, Frank. Thank you. It's nice meeting you. Greatly Good appreciate night. your time. All right, guys. Good night. Good, Good night, night, everyone.